by William Tecumseh Sherman. Sherman's March to the Sea and the Burning of Columbia, South Carolina, from his memoirs. Nearly ten years have passed since the close of the Civil War in America, and yet no satisfactory history thereof is accessible to the public, nor should any be attempted until the government has published and placed within the reach of students the abundant materials that are buried in the War Department at Washington. These are in process of compilation, but at the rate of progress for the past ten years, it is probable that a new century will come before they are published and circulated, with full indexes to enable the historian to make a judicious selection of materials. What is now offered is not designed as a history of the war, or even as a complete account of all the incidents in which the writer bore a part, but merely his recollection of events, corrected by a reference to his own memoranda, which may assist the future historian when he comes to describe the whole, and account for the motives and reasons which influenced some of the actors in the grand drama of war. I trust a perusal of these pages will prove interesting to the survivors who have manifested so often their intense love of the cause which moved a nation to vindicate its own authority, and equally so to the rising generation who therefrom may learn that a country and government such as ours are worth fighting for and dying for, if need be. If successful in this, I shall feel amply repaid for departing from the usage of military men, who seldom attempt to publish their own deeds, but rest content with simply contributing by their acts to the honor and glory of their country. William Sherman, General, St. Louis, Missouri, January 21, 1875 Another ten years have passed since I ventured to publish my memoirs, and being once more at leisure, I have revised them in the light of the many criticisms, public and private. My habit has been to note in pencil the suggestions of critics, and to examine the substance of their differences, for critics must differ from the author to manifest their superiority. Where I have found material error, I have corrected, and I have added two chapters, one at the beginning, another at the end, both of the most general character, and an appendix. I wish my friends and enemies to understand that I disclaim the character of historian, but assume to be a witness on the stand before the Grand Tribunal of History to assist some future Napier, Allison, or Hume to comprehend the feelings and thoughts of the actors in the grand conflicts of the recent past, and thereby to lessen his labors in the compilation necessary for the future benefit of mankind. In this free country every man is at perfect liberty to publish his own thoughts and impressions, and any witness who may differ from me should publish his own version of facts in the truthful narration of which he is interested. I am publishing my own memoirs, not theirs, and we all know that no three honest witnesses of a simple brawl can agree on all the details. How much more likely will be the difference in a great battle covering a vast space of broken ground, when each division, brigade, regiment, and even company naturally and honestly believes that it was the focus of the whole affair. Each of them won the battle. None ever lost. That was the fate of the old man who unhappily commanded. In this edition I give the best maps which I believe have ever been prepared, compiled by General O. M. Poe, from personal knowledge and official surveys, and what I chiefly aim to establish is the true cause of the results which are already known to the whole world, and it may be a relief to many to know that I shall publish no other, but like the player at cards, will stand. Not that I have accomplished perfection, but because I can do no better with the cards in hand. Of omissions there are plenty, but of willful perversion of facts, none. In the preface to the first edition in 1875, I used these words. Nearly ten years have passed since the close of the Civil War in America, and yet no satisfactory history thereof is accessible to the public, nor should any be attempted until the government has published and placed within the reach of students the abundant materials that are buried in the War Department at Washington. These are in process of compilation, 
but at the rate of progress for the past ten years it is probable that a new century will come before they are published and circulated with full indexes to enable the historian to make a judicious selection of materials another decade is past and i am in possession of all these publications my last being volume eleven part three series one the last date in which is august thirty eighteen sixty two i am afraid that if i assume again the character of prophet i must extend the time deep into the next century and pray meanwhile that the official records of the war union and confederate may approach completion before the next war or rather that we as a people may be spared another war until the last one is officially recorded meantime the rising generation must be content with memoirs and histories compiled from the best sources available in this sense i offer mine as to the events of which i was an eyewitness and participant or for which i was responsible william sherman general retired st louis missouri march thirty eighteen eighty five atlanta and after pursuit of hood september and october eighteen sixty four by this date under the intelligent and energetic action of colonel w w wright and with the labor of fifteen hundred men the railroad break of fifteen miles about dalton was repaired so far as to admit of the passage of cars and i transferred my headquarters to kingston as more central and from that place on the same day november second again telegraphed to general grant kingston georgia november two eighteen eighty four lieutenant general u s grant city point virginia if i turn back the whole effect of my campaign will be lost by my movements i have thrown beauregard hood well to the west and thomas will have ample time and sufficient troops to hold him until the reinforcements from missouri reach him we have now ample supplies at chattanooga and atlanta and can stand a month's interruption to our communications i do not believe the confederate army can reach our railroad lines except by cavalry raids and wilson will have cavalry enough to checkmate them i am clearly of opinion that the best results will follow my contemplated movement through georgia w t sherman major general that same day i received in answer to the rome dispatch the following city point virginia november two eighteen sixty four eleven thirty a m major general sherman your dispatch of nine a m yesterday is just received i dispatched you the same date advising that hood's army now that it had worked so far north ought to be looked upon now as the object with the force however that you have left with general thomas he must be able to take care of hood and destroy him i do not see that you can withdraw from where you are to follow hood without giving up all we have gained in territory i say then go on as you propose u s grant lieutenant general this was the first time that general grant ordered the march to the sea and although many of his warm friends and admirers insist that he was the author and projector of that march and that i simply executed his plans general grant has never in my opinion thought so or said so the truth is fully given in an original letter of president lincoln which i received at savannah georgia and have at this instant before me every word of which is in his own familiar handwriting it is dated washington december twenty sixth eighteen sixty four when you were about leaving atlanta for the atlantic coast i was anxious if not fearful but feeling that you were the better judge and remembering nothing risked nothing gained i did not interfere now the undertaking being a success the honor is all yours for i believe none of us went further than to acquiesce and taking the work of general thomas into account as it should be taken it is indeed a great success not only does it afford the obvious and immediate military advantages but in showing to the world that your army could be divided putting the stronger part to an important new service and yet leaving enough to vanquish the old opposing force of the whole hood's army it brings those who sat in darkness to see a great light but what next 
I suppose it will be safer if I leave General Grant and yourself to decide. A. Lincoln Of course, this judgment, made after the event, was extremely flattering, and was all I ever expected, a recognition of the truth and of its importance. I have often been asked by well-meaning friends when the thought of that march first entered my mind. I knew that an army which had penetrated Georgia as far as Atlanta could not turn back. It must go ahead. But when, how, and where depended on many considerations. As soon as Hood had shifted across from Lovejoy's to Palmetto, I saw the move in my mind's eye, and after Jeff Davis's speech at Palmetto of September 26th, I was more positive in my conviction, but was in doubt as to the time and manner. When General Hood first struck our railroad above Marietta, we were not ready, and I was forced to watch his movements further till he had caromed off to the west of Decatur. Then I was perfectly convinced and had no longer a shadow of doubt. The only possible question was to Thomas's strength and ability to meet Hood in the open field. I did not suppose that General Hood, though rash, would venture to attack fortified places like Alatuna, Resaca, Decatur, and Nashville. But he did so, and in so doing, he played into our hands perfectly. On the 2nd of November, I was in Kingston, Georgia, and my four corps, the 15th, 17th, 14th, and 20th, with one division of cavalry, were strung from Rome to Atlanta. Our railroads and telegraph had been repaired, and I deliberately prepared for the march to Savannah, distant three hundred miles from Atlanta. All the sick and wounded men had been sent back by rail to Chattanooga. All our wagon trains had been carefully overhauled and loaded, so as to be ready to start on an hour's notice, and there was no serious enemy in our front. General Hood remained still at Florence, Alabama, occupying both banks of the Tennessee River, busy in collecting shoes and clothing for his men, and the necessary ammunition and stores with which to invade Tennessee, most of which had to come from Mobile, Selma, and Montgomery, Alabama, over railroads that were still broken. Beauregard was at Corinth, hastening forward these necessary preparations. General Thomas was at Nashville with Wilson's dismounted cavalry, and a mass of new troops and quartermaster's employees, amply sufficient to defend the place. The 4th and 23rd Corps, under General Stanley and Schofield, were posted at Pulaski, Tennessee, and the cavalry of Hatch, Croxton, and Capron were about Florence, watching Hood. Smith's A.J., two divisions of the 16th Corps, were still in Missouri, but were reported as ready to embark at Lexington for the Cumberland River and Nashville. Of course, General Thomas saw that on him would likely fall the real blow, and was naturally anxious. He still kept Granger's division at Decatur, Rousseau's at Murfreesboro, and Steedsman at Chattanooga, with strong railroad guards at all the essential points intermediate, confident that by means of this very railroad he could make his concentration sooner than Hood could possibly march up from Florence. Meantime, General F. P. Blair had rejoined his corps, 17th, and we were receiving at Kingston recruits and returned furlough men, distributing them to their proper companies. Paymasters had come down to pay off our men before their departure to a new sphere of action, and commissioners were also on hand from the several states to take the vote of our men in the presidential election then agitating the country. On the 6th of November, at Kingston, I wrote and telegraphed to General Grant, reviewing the whole situation, gave him my full plan of action, stated that I was ready to march as soon as the election was over, and appointed November 10th as the day for starting. On the 8th, I received this dispatch. City Point, Virginia, November 7, 1864, 10.30 p.m., Major General Sherman, your dispatch of this evening received. I see no present reason for changing your plan. Should any arise, you will see it, or if I do, I will inform you. I think everything here is favorable now. Great good fortune attend you. I believe you will be eminently successful, and at worst, 
can only make a march less fruitful of results than hoped for. U.S. Grant, Lieutenant General. Meantime, trains of cars were whirling by, carrying to the rear an immense amount of stores which had accumulated at Atlanta and at the other stations along the railroad, and General Steedman had come down to Kingston to take charge of the final evacuation and withdrawal of the several garrisons below Chattanooga. On the 10th of November, the movement may be said to have fairly begun. All the troops designed for the campaign were ordered to march for Atlanta, and General Corse, before evacuating his post at Rome, was ordered to burn all the mills, factories, etc., etc., that could be useful to the enemy should he undertake to pursue us or resume military possession of the country. This was done on the night of the 10th, and next day Corse reached Kingston. On the 11th, General Thomas and I interchanged full dispatches. He had heard of the arrival of General A.J. Smith's two divisions at Paducah, which would surely reach Nashville much sooner than General Hood could possibly do from Florence, so that he was perfectly satisfied with his share of the army. On the 12th, with a full staff, I started from Kingston for Atlanta, and about noon of that day we reached Cartersville and sat on the edge of a porch to rest when the telegraph operator, Mr. Van Valkenburg, or Eddie, got the wire down from the poles to his lap, in which he held a small pocket instrument. Calling Chattanooga, he received this message from General Thomas, dated Nashville, November 12, 1884, 8.80 a.m. Major General Sherman your dispatch of twelve o'clock last night is received. I have no fears that Beauregard can do us any harm now, and if he attempts to follow you, I will follow him as far as possible. If he does not follow you, I will then thoroughly organize my troops, and believe I shall have enough men to ruin him unless he gets out of the way very rapidly. The country of Middle Alabama, I learn, is teeming with supplies this year, which will be greatly to our advantage. I have no additional news to report from the direction of Florence. I am now convinced that the greater part of Beauregard's army is near Florence and Tuscumbia, and that you will have at least a clear road before you for several days, and that your success will fully equal your expectations. George H. Thomas, Major General. I answered simply, Dispatch received, all right. About that instant of time, some of our men burnt a bridge, which severed the telegraph wire, and all communication with the rear ceased thenceforth. As we rode on toward Atlanta that night, I remember the railroad trains going to the rear with a furious speed, the engineers and a few men about the trains waving us an affectionate adieu. It surely was a strange event two hostile armies marching in opposite directions, each in the full belief that it was achieving a final and conclusive result in a great war, and I was strongly inspired with the feeling that the movement on our part was a direct attack upon the rebel army and the rebel capital at Richmond, though a full thousand miles of hostile country intervened, and that, for better or worse, it would end the war. The March to the Sea from Atlanta to Savannah, November and December, 1864. On the 12th of November, the railroad and telegraph communications with the rear were broken, and the army stood detached from all friends, dependent on its own resources and supplies. No time was to be lost. All the detachments were ordered to march rapidly for Atlanta, breaking up the railroad en route, and generally to so much damage in the country as to make it untenable to the enemy. By the 14th, all the troops had arrived at or near Atlanta, and were, according to orders, grouped into two wings, the right and left, commanded respectively by Major Generals O. O. Howard and H. W. Slocum, both comparatively young men, but educated and experienced officers, fully competent to their command. The right wing was composed of the 15th Corps, Major General P. J. Osterhaus commanding, and the 17th Corps, Major General Frank P. Blair commanding. The left wing was composed of the 14th Corps, Major General Jefferson C. Davis commanding, and the 20th Corps, Brigadier General A. S. Williams commanding. 
The 15th Corps had four divisions commanded by Brigadier Generals Charles R. Woods, W. B. Hazen, John E. Smith, and John M. Gorse. The 17th Corps had three divisions commanded by Major General J. A. Mauer and Brigadier Generals M. D. Leggett and Giles A. Smith. The 14th Corps had three divisions commanded by Brigadier Generals W. P. Carlin, James D. Morgan, and A. Baird. The 20th Corps had also three divisions, commanded by Brigadier Generals N.J. Jackson, John W. Gary, and W.T. Ward. The Cavalry Division was held separate, subject to my own orders. It was commanded by Brigadier General Judson Kilpatrick, and was composed of two brigades, commanded by Colonels Eli H. Murray of Kentucky and Smith D. Atkins of Illinois. The strength of the Army, as officially reported, is given in the following tables, and shows an aggregate of 55,329 infantry, 5,063 cavalry, and 1,812 artillery, in all 62,204 officers and men. The most extraordinary efforts had been made to purge this army of non-combatants and of sick men, for we knew well that there was to be no place of safety save with the army itself. Our wagons were loaded with ammunition, provisions, and forage, and we could ill afford to haul even sick men in the ambulances, so that all on this exhibit may be assumed to have been able-bodied, experienced soldiers, well-armed, well-equipped, and provided, as far as human foresight could, with all the essentials of life, strength, and vigorous action. The two general orders made for this march appear to me, even at this late date, so clear, emphatic, and well digested, that no account of that historic event is perfect without them, and I give them entire, even at the seeming appearance of repetition. And though they called for great sacrifice and labor on the part of officers and men, I insist that these orders were obeyed as well as any similar orders ever were, by an army operating wholly in an enemy's country, and dispersed as we necessarily were, during the subsequent period of nearly six months. Special Field Orders Number 119 Headquarters, Military Division of the Mississippi in the Field, Kingston, Georgia, November 8, 1864 The General Commanding deems it proper at this time to inform the officers and men of the 14th, 15th, 17th, and 20th Corps that he has organized them into an army for a special purpose, well known to the War Department and to General Grant. It is sufficient for you to know that it involves a departure from our present base and a long and difficult march to a new one. All the chances of war have been considered and provided for as far as human sagacity can. All he asks of you is to maintain that discipline, patience, and courage which have characterized you in the past, and he hopes, through you, to strike a blow at our enemy that will have a material effect in producing what we all so much desire, his complete overthrow. Of all things, the most important is that the men, during marches and in camp, keep their places and do not scatter about as stragglers or foragers to be picked up by a hostile people in detail. It is also of the utmost importance that our wagons should not be loaded with anything but provisions and ammunition. All surplus servants, non-combatants, and refugees should now go to the rear, and none should be encouraged to encumber us on the march. At some future time we will be able to provide for the poor whites and blacks who seek to escape the bondage under which they are now suffering. With these few simple cautions, he hopes to lead you to achievements equal in importance to those of the past. By order of Major General W. T. Sherman, L. M. Dayton, aide-de-camp. Special Field Orders No. 120 Headquarters, Military Division of the Mississippi in the Field, Kingston, Georgia, November 9, 1864. 1. For the purpose of military operations, this army is divided into two wings, viz. the right wing, Major General O. O. Howard commanding, composed of the 15th and 17th Corps, the left wing, Major General H. W. Slocum commanding, composed of the 14th and 20th Corps. 2. 
The habitual order of march will be, wherever practicable, by four roads, as nearly parallel as possible, and converging at points, hereafter to be indicated in orders. The cavalry, Brigadier General Kilpatrick commanding, will receive special orders from the Commander-in-Chief. 3. There will be no general train of supplies, but each corps will have its ammunition train and provision train distributed habitually as follows. Behind each regiment should follow one wagon and one ambulance. Behind each brigade should follow a due proportion of ammunition wagons, provision wagons, and ambulances. In case of danger, each corps commander should change this order of march by having his advance and rear brigades unencumbered by wheels. The separate columns will start habitually at 7 a.m. and make about 15 miles per day, unless otherwise fixed in orders. 4. The army will forage liberally on the country during the march. To this end, each brigade commander will organize a good and sufficient foraging party under the command of one or more discreet officers who will gather, near the route traveled, corn or forage of any kind, meat of any kind, vegetables, cornmeal, or whatever is needed by the command, aiming at all times to keep in the wagons at least ten days' provisions for his command and three days' forage. Soldiers must not enter the dwellings of the inhabitants or commit any trespass, but during a halt or camp they may be permitted to gather turnips, potatoes, and other vegetables, and to drive in stock in sight of their camp. To regular foraging parties must be entrusted the gathering of provisions and forage at any distance from the road traveled. 6. To corps commanders alone is entrusted the power to destroy mills, houses, cotton gins, etc., and for them this general principle is laid down. In districts and neighborhoods where the army is unmolested, no destruction of each property should be permitted, but should guerrillas or bushwhackers molest our march, or should the inhabitants burn bridges, obstruct roads, or otherwise manifest local hostility, then army commanders should order and enforce a devastation more or less relentless according to the measure of such hostility. 6. As for horses, mules, wagons, etc., belonging to the inhabitants, the cavalry and artillery may appropriate freely and without limit, discriminating, however, between the rich, who are usually hostile, and the poor and industrious, usually neutral or friendly. Foraging parties may also take mules or horses to replace the jaded animals of their trains, or to serve as pack mules for the regiments or brigades. In all foraging of whatever kind, the parties engaged will refrain from abusive or threatening language, and may, where the officer in command thinks proper, give written certificates of the facts, but no receipts, and they will endeavor to leave with each family a reasonable portion for their maintenance. 7. Negroes who are able-bodied and can be of service to the several columns may be taken along but each army commander will bear in mind that the question of supplies is a very important one, and that his first duty is to see to those who bear arms. 8. The organization at once of a good pioneer battalion for each army corps, composed, if possible, of Negroes, should be attended to. This battalion should follow the advance guard, repair roads, and double them, if possible, so that the columns will not be delayed after reaching bad places. Also, army commanders should practice the habit of giving the artillery and wagons the road, marching their troops on one side, and instruct their troops to assist wagons at steep hills or bad crossings of streams. 9. Captain O. M. Poe, Chief Engineer, will assign to each wing of the army a pontoon train, fully equipped and organized, and the commanders thereof will see to their being properly protected at all times. By order of Major General W. T. Sherman, L. M. Dayton, aide de camp. The greatest possible attention had been given to the artillery and wagon trains. The number of guns had been reduced to sixty-five, or about one gun to each thousand men, and these were generally in batteries of four guns each. 
Each gun, caisson, and forges was drawn by four teams of horses. We had in all about 2,500 wagons, with teams of six mules to each, and 600 ambulances, with two horses to each. The loads were made comparatively light, about 2,500 pounds net, each wagon carrying in addition the forage needed by its own team. Each soldier carried on his person forty rounds of ammunition, and in the wagons were enough cartridges to make up about two hundred rounds per man, and in like manner two hundred rounds of assorted ammunition were carried for each gun. The wagon trains were divided equally between the four corps, so that each had about eight hundred wagons, and these, usually on the march, occupied five miles or more of road. Each corps commander managed his own train, and habitually the artillery and wagons had the road, while the men, with the exception of the advance and rear guards, pursued paths improvised by the aid of the wagons, unless they were forced to use a bridge or causeway in common. I reached Atlanta during the afternoon of the 14th, and found that all preparations had been made. Colonel Beckwith, chief commissary, reporting 1,200,000 rations in possession of the troops, which was about 20 days' supply, and he had on hand a good supply of beef cattle to be driven along on the hoof. Of forage the supply was limited, being of oats and corn enough for five days, but I knew that within that time we would reach a country well stocked with corn, which had been gathered and stored in cribs, seemingly for our use, by Governor Brown's militia. Colonel Poe, United States Engineers, of my staff, had been busy in his special task of destruction. He had a large force at work, had leveled the great depot, roundhouse, and the machine shops of the Georgia Railroad, and had applied fire to the wreck. One of these machine shops had been used by the rebels as an arsenal, and in it were stored piles of shot and shell, some of which proved to be loaded, and that night was made hideous by the bursting of shells, whose fragments came uncomfortably near Judge Lyon's house, in which I was quartered. The fire also reached the block of stores near the depot, and the heart of the city was in flames all night, but the fire did not reach the parts of Atlanta where the courthouse was, or the great mass of dwelling houses. The march from Atlanta began on the morning of November 15th, the right wing and cavalry following the railroad southeast towards Jonesboro, and General Slocum with the 20th Corps leading off to the east by Decatur and Stone Mountain toward Madison. These were divergent lines designed to threaten both Mason and Augusta at the same time, so as to prevent a concentration at our intended destination or objective, Milledgeville, the capital of Georgia, distant southeast about 100 miles. The time allowed each column for reaching Milledgeville was seven days. I remained in Atlanta during the 15th with the 14th Corps and the rear guard of the right wing to complete the loading of the trains and the destruction of the buildings of Atlanta which could be converted to hostile uses, and on the morning of the 16th started with my personal staff a company of Alabama cavalry commanded by Lt. Snelling and an infantry company commanded by Lt. McCrory, which guarded our small train of wagons. My staff was then composed of Major L. M. Dayton, aide-de-camp, and acting adjutant-general, Major J. C. McCoy, and Major J. C. Audenreed, aides. Major Ward Nichols had joined some weeks before at Galesville, Alabama, and was attached as an acting aide-de-camp. Also, Major Henry Hitchcock had joined at the same time as judge advocate. Colonel Charles Ewing was Inspector General, and Surgeon John Moore, Medical Director. These constituted our mess. We had no tents, only the flies, with which we nightly made bivouacs, with the assistance of the abundant pine boughs, which made excellent shelter as well as beds. Colonel L. C. Easton was Chief Quartermaster, Colonel Amos Beckwith, Chief Commissary, Colonel O. M. Poe, Chief Engineer, and Colonel T. G. Baylor, Chief of Ordnance. These invariably rode with us during the day, but they had separate camp and mess at night. 
General William F. Berry had been chief of artillery in the previous campaign, but at Kingston his face was so swollen with erysipelas that he was reluctantly compelled to leave us for the rear, and he could not, on recovering, rejoin us till we had reached Savannah. About 7 a.m. of November 16th, we rode out of Atlanta by the Decatur Road, filled by the marching troops and wagons of the fourteenth corps and reaching the hill just outside of the old rebel works we naturally paused to look back upon the scenes of our past battles we stood upon the very ground whereon was fought the bloody battle of july twenty second and could see the copse of wood where mcpherson fell behind us lay atlanta smouldering and in ruins the black smoke rising high in the air and hanging like a pall over the ruined city away off in the distance on the mcdonough road was the rear of howard's column the gun barrels glistening in the sun the white-topped wagons stretching away to the south and right before us the fourteenth corps marching steadily and rapidly with a cheery look and swinging pace that made light of the thousand miles that lay between us and richmond some band by accident struck up the anthem of john brown's soul goes marching on the men caught up the strain and never before or since have i heard the chorus of glory glory hallelujah done with more spirit or in better harmony of time and place then we turned our horses' heads to the east. Atlanta was soon lost behind the screen of trees and became a thing of the past. Around it clings many a thought of a desperate battle, of hope and fear, that now seem like the memory of a dream, and I have never seen the place since. The day was extremely beautiful, clear sunlight with bracing air, and an unusual feeling of exhilaration seemed to pervade all minds, a feeling of something to come, vague and undefined, still full of venture and intense interest. Even the common soldiers caught the inspiration, and many a group called out to me as I worked my way past them, Uncle Billy, I guess Grant is waiting for us at Richmond. Indeed, the general sentiment was that we were marching for Richmond, and that there we should end the war, but how and when they seemed to care not. Nor did they measure the distance, or count the cost in life, or bother their brains about the great rivers to be crossed, and the food required for man and beast that had to be gathered by the way. There was a devil-may-care feeling pervading officers and men that made me feel the full load of responsibility, for success would be accepted as a matter of course, whereas should we fail, this march would be a judge the wild adventure of a crazy fool. I had no purpose to march direct for Richmond by way of Augusta and Charlotte, but always designed to reach the sea coast first at Savannah or Port Royal, South Carolina, and even kept in mind the alternative of Pensacola. The first night out we camped by the roadside near Lithonia. Stone Mountain, a mass of granite, was in plain view, cut out in clear outline against the blue sky. The whole horizon was lurid with the bonfires of rail ties, and groups of men all night were carrying the heated rails to the nearest trees and bending them around the trunks. Colonel Poe had provided tools for ripping up the rails and twisting them when hot, but the best and easiest way is the one I have described, of heating the middle of the iron rails on bonfires made of the cross ties, and then winding them around a telegraph pole or the trunk of some convenient sapling. I attached much importance to this destruction of the railroad, gave it my own personal attention, and made reiterated orders to others on the subject. The next day we passed through the handsome town of Covington, the soldiers closing up their ranks, the color-bearers unfurling their flags, and the bands striking up patriotic airs. The white people came out of their houses to behold the sight, spite of their deep hatred of the invaders, and the negroes were simply frantic with joy. Whenever they heard my name, they clustered about my horse, shouted and prayed in their peculiar style, which had a natural eloquence that would have moved a stone. I have witnessed hundreds, if not thousands, of such scenes, and can now see a poor girl in the very ecstasy of the Methodist shout, hugging the banner of one of the regiments, and jumping up to the feet of Jesus. 
I remember when riding around by a by street in Covington to avoid the crowd that followed the marching column that someone brought me an invitation to dine with the sister of Sam Anderson, who was a cadet at West Point with me. But the messenger reached me after we had passed the main part of the town. I asked to be excused and rode on to a place designated for camp at the crossing of the Ulkafawichi River about four miles to the east of the town. Here we made our bivouac, and I walked up to a plantation house close by, where were assembled many negroes, among them an old gray-haired man of as fine a head as I ever saw. I asked him if he understood about the war and its progress. He said he did, that he had been looking for the angel of the Lord ever since he was knee-high, and though we professed to be fighting for the Union, he supposed that slavery was the cause and that our success was to be his freedom. I asked him if all the Negro slaves comprehended this fact, and he said they surely did. I then explained to him that we wanted the slaves to remain where they were, and not to load us down with useless mouths which would eat up the food needed for our fighting men, that our success was their assured freedom, that we could receive a few of their young, hearty men as pioneers, but that, if they followed us in swarms of old and young, feeble and helpless, it would simply load us down and cripple us in our great task. I think Major Henry Hitchcock was with me on that occasion and made a note of the conversation, and I believe that old man spread this message to the slaves, which was carried from mouth to mouth to the very end of our journey, and that it in part saved us from the great danger we incurred of swelling our numbers, so that famine would have attended our progress. It was at this very plantation that a soldier passed me with a ham on his musket, a jug of sour molasses under his arm, and a big piece of honey in his hand, from which he was eating, and catching my eye, he remarked sotto voce and carelessly to a comrade, forage liberally on the country, quoting from my general orders. On this occasion, as on many others that fell under my personal observation, I reproved the man, explained that foraging must be limited to the regular parties properly detailed, and that all provisions thus obtained must be delivered to the regular commissaries, to be fairly distributed to the men who kept their ranks. From Covington, the 14th Corps, Davis's, with which I was traveling, turned to the right for Milledgeville via Shady Dale. General Slocum was ahead at Madison with the 20th Corps, having torn up the railroad as far as that place, and thence had sent Geary's division on to the Oconee to burn the bridges across that stream, when his corps turned south by Eatonton for Milledgeville, the common objective for the first stage of the march. We found abundance of corn, molasses, meal, bacon, and sweet potatoes. We also took a good many cows and oxen and a large number of mules. In all these, the country was quite rich, never before having been visited by a hostile army. The recent crop had been excellent, had been just gathered and laid by for the winter. As a rule, we destroyed none, but kept our wagons full and fed our teams bountifully. The skill and success of the men in collecting forage was one of the features of this march. Each brigade commander had authority to detail a company of foragers, usually about fifty men, with one or two commissioned officers selected for their boldness and enterprise. This party would be dispatched before daylight with the knowledge of the intended day's march and camp, would proceed on foot five or six miles from the route traveled by their brigade, and then visit every plantation and farm within range. They would usually procure a wagon or family carriage, load it with bacon, cornmeal, turkeys, chickens, ducks, and everything that could be used as food or forage, and would then regain the main road, usually in advance of their train. When this came up, they would deliver to the brigade commissary the supplies thus gathered by the way. Often would I pass these foraging parties at the roadside, waiting for their wagons to come up, and thus amused at their strange collections, mules, horses, even cattle, packed with old saddles and loaded with hams, bacon, bags of cornmeal, and poultry of every character and description. Although this foraging was attended with great danger and hard work, there seemed to be a charm about it that attracted the soldiers, and it was a privilege to be detailed on such a party. 
Daily they returned, mounted on all sorts of beasts, which were at once taken from them and appropriated to the general use, but the next day they would start out again on foot, only to repeat the experience of the day before. No doubt many acts of pillage, robbery, and violence were committed by these parties of foragers, usually called bummers, for I have since heard of jewelry taken from women and the plunder of articles that never reached the commissary. But these acts were exceptional and incidental. I never heard of any cases of murder or rape, and no army could have carried along sufficient food and forage for a march of three hundred miles, so that foraging in some shape was necessary. The country was sparsely settled, with no magistrates or civil authorities who could respond to requisitions, as is done in all the wars of Europe, so that this system of foraging was simply indispensable to our success. By it our men were well supplied with all the essentials of life and health, while the wagons retained enough in case of unexpected delay, and our animals were well fed. Indeed, when we reached Savannah, the trains were pronounced by experts to be the finest in flesh and appearance ever seen with any army. Habitually, each corps followed some main road, and the foragers, being kept out on the exposed flank, served all the military uses of flankers. The main columns gathered, by the roads traveled, much forage and food, chiefly meat, corn, and sweet potatoes, and it was the duty of each division and brigade quartermaster to fill his wagons as fast as the contents were issued to the troops. The wagon trains had the right to the road always, but each wagon was required to keep closed up so as to leave no gaps in the column. If for any purpose any wagon or group of wagons dropped out of place, they had to wait for the rear, and this was always dreaded for each brigade commander wanted his train up at camp as soon after reaching it with his men as possible. I have seen much skill and industry displayed by these quartermasters on the march in trying to load their wagons with corn and fodder by the way without losing their place in column. They would, while marching, shift the loads of wagons so as to have six or ten of them empty, then, riding well ahead, they would secure possession of certain stacks of fodder near the road, or cribs of corn, leave some men in charge, then open fences and a road back for a couple of miles, return to their trains, divert the empty wagons out of column, and conduct them rapidly to their forage, load up and regain their place in column without losing distance. On one occasion, I remember to have seen ten or a dozen wagons thus loaded with corn from two or three full cribs, almost without halting. These cribs were built of logs and roofed. The train guards by a lever had raised the whole side of the crib a foot or two, the wagons drove close alongside, and the men in the cribs, lying on their backs, kicked out a wagon load of corn in the time I have taken to describe it. In a well-ordered and well-disciplined army, these things might be deemed irregular, but I am convinced that the ingenuity of these younger officers accomplished many things far better than I could have ordered, and the marches were thus made, and the distances were accomplished in the most admirable way. Habitually we started from camp at the earliest break of dawn, and usually reached camp soon after noon. The marches varied from ten to fifteen miles a day, though sometimes on extreme flanks it was necessary to make as much as twenty, but the rate of travel was regulated by the wagons, and considering the nature of the roads, fifteen miles per day was deemed the limit. The pontoon trains were in like manner distributed in about equal proportions to the four corps, giving each a section of about nine hundred feet. The pontoons were of the skeleton pattern, with cotton canvas covers, each boat with its proportion of bulks and cheeses constituting a load for one wagon. By uniting two such sections together, we could make a bridge of 1,800 feet, enough for any river we had to traverse. But habitually the leading brigade would, out of the abundant timber, improvise a bridge before the pontoon train could come up, unless in the cases of rivers of considerable magnitude, such as the Ukmulji, Okani, Uguchi, Savannah, etc. On the 20th of November, I was still with the 14th Corps near Eatonton Factory, waiting to hear of the 20th Corps, 
and on the 21st we camped near the house of a man named Mann. The next day, about 4 p.m., General Davis had halted his head of column on a wooded ridge overlooking an extensive slope of cultivated country about 10 miles short of Milledgeville, and was deploying his troops for camp when I got up. There was a high, raw wind blowing, and I asked him why he had chosen so cold and bleak a position. He explained that he had accomplished his full distance for the day, and had there an abundance of wood and water. He explained further that his advance guard was a mile or so ahead, so I rode on, asking him to let his rear division, as it came up, move some distance ahead into the depression or valley beyond. Riding on some distance to the border of a plantation, I turned out of the main road into a cluster of wild plum bushes that broke the force of the cold November wind, dismounted, and instructed the staff to pick out the place for our camp. The afternoon was unusually raw and cold. My orderly was at hand with his invariable saddle-bags, which contained a change of underclothing, my maps, a flask of whiskey, and bunch of cigars. Taking a drink and lighting a cigar, I walked to a row of negro huts close by, entered one, and found a soldier or two warming themselves by a wood fire. I took their place by the fire, intending to wait there till our wagons had got up, and a camp made for the night. I was talking to the old negro woman, when someone came and explained to me that, if I would come farther down the road, I could find a better place. So I started on foot, and found on the main road a good double-hued log house, in one room of which Colonel Poe, Dr. Moore, and others had started a fire. I sent back orders to the plum bushes to bring our horses and saddles up to this house, and an orderly to conduct our headquarter wagons to the same place. In looking around the room, I saw a small box, like a candle box, marked Howell Cobb, and on inquiring of a negro, found that we were at the plantation of General Howell Cobb of Georgia, one of the leading rebels of the South then a general in the Southern Army, and who had been Secretary of the United States Treasury in Mr. Buchanan's time. Of course, we confiscated his property and found it rich in corn, beans, peanuts, and sorghum molasses. Extensive fields were all around the house. I sent word back to General David to explain whose plantation it was, and instructed him to spare nothing. That night huge bonfires consumed the fence rails, kept our soldiers warm, and the teamsters and men, as well as the slaves, carried off an immense quantity of corn and provisions of all sorts. In due season the headquarter wagons came up and we got supper. After supper I sat on a chair astride, with my back to a good fire, musing, and became conscious that an old negro with a tallow candle in his hand was scanning my face closely. I inquired, "'What do you want, old man?' He answered, "'De say you is Massa Sherman.' I answered that such was the case, and inquired what he wanted. He only wanted to look at me, and kept muttering, "'Dis nigger can't sleep dis night.' I asked him why he trembled so, and he said that he wanted to be sure that we were in fact Yankees, for on a former occasion some rebel cavalry had put on light blue overcoats personating Yankee troops, and many of the negroes were deceived thereby, himself among the number, had shown them sympathy, and had in consequence been unmercifully beaten therefore. This time he wanted to be certain before committing himself. So I told him to go out on the porch, from which he could see the whole horizon lit up with campfires, and he could then judge whether he had ever seen anything like it before. The old man became convinced that the Yankees had come at last, about whom he had been dreaming all his life, and some of the staff officers gave him a strong drink of whiskey, which set his tongue going. Lieutenant Spelling, who commanded my escort, was a Georgian, and recognized in this old negro a favorite slave of his uncle, who resided about six miles off. But the old slave did not at first recognize his young master in our uniform. One of my staff officers asked him what had become of his young master, George. He did not know, only that he had gone off to the war, and he supposed him killed, as a matter of course. His attention was then drawn to Spelling's face, when he fell on his knees and thanked God that he had found his young master alive, and along with the Yankees. 
Spelling inquired all about his uncle and the family, asked my permission to go and pay his uncle a visit, which I granted, of course, and the next morning he described to me his visit. The uncle was not cordial by any means to find his nephew in the ranks of the host that was desolating the land, and Spelling came back, having exchanged his tired horse for a fresher one out of his uncle's stables, explaining that surely some of the bummers would have got the horse had he not. The next morning, November 23rd, we rode into Milledgeville, the capital of the state, whither the 20th Corps had preceded us, and during that day the left wing was all united in and around Milledgeville. From the inhabitants we learned that some of Kilpatrick's cavalry had preceded us by a couple of days, and that all of the right wing was at and near Gordon, twelve miles off, viz. the place where the Branch Railroad came to Milledgeville from the Mason and Savannah Road. The first stage of the journey was therefore complete and absolutely successful. General Howard soon reported by letter the operations of his right wing, which on leaving Atlanta had substantially followed the two roads toward Mason by Jonesboro and McDonough, and reached the Okmulgee at Planter's Factory, which they crossed by the aid of the pontoon train during the 18th and 19th of November. Thence, with the 17th Corps, General Blair's, he, General Howard, had marched via Monticello toward Gordon, having dispatched Kilpatrick's cavalry, supported by the 15th Corps, Osterhouses, to Fane on Mason. Kilpatrick met the enemy's cavalry about four miles out of Mason and drove them rapidly back into the bridge defenses held by infantry. Kilpatrick charged these, got inside the parapet, but could not hold it, and retired to his infantry supports near Griswold Station. The 15th Corps tore up the railroad track eastward from Griswold, leaving Charles R. Wood's division behind as a rear guard, one brigade of which was entrenched across the road, with some of Kilpatrick's cavalry on the flanks. On the 22nd of November, General G.W. Smith, with a division of troops, came out of Mason, attacked this brigade, Walcutts, in position, and was handsomely repulsed and driven back into Mason. This brigade was in part armed with Spencer repeating rifles, and its fire was so rapid that General Smith insists to this day that he encountered a whole division. But he is mistaken. He was beaten by one brigade, Walcutts, and made no further effort to molest our operations from that direction. General Walcutt was wounded in the leg and had to ride the rest of the distance to Savannah in a carriage. Therefore, by the 23rd, I was in Milledgeville with the left wing and was in full communication with the right wing at Gordon. The people of Milledgeville remained at home, except the governor, Brown, the state officers and legislature, who had ignominiously fled, in the utmost disorder and confusion. Standing not on the order of their going, but going at once, some by rail, some by carriages, and many on foot. Some of the citizens who remained behind described this flight of the brave and patriotic Governor Brown. He had occupied a public building known as the Governor's Mansion, and had hastily stripped it of carpets, curtains, and furniture of all sorts, which were removed to a train of freight cars, which carried away these things, even the cabbages and vegetables from the kitchen and cellar, leaving behind muskets, ammunition, and the public archives. On arrival at Milledgeville, I occupied the same public mansion, and was soon overwhelmed with appeals for protection. General Slocum had previously arrived with the 20th Corps, had taken up his quarters at the Milledgeville Hotel, established a good provost guard, and excellent order was maintained. The most frantic appeals had been made by the governor and legislature for help from every quarter, and the people of the state had been called out en masse to resist and destroy the invaders of their homes and firesides. Even the prisoners and convicts of the penitentiary were released on condition of serving as soldiers, and the cadets were taken from their military college for the same purpose. These constituted a small battalion under General Harry Wayne, a former officer of the United States Army, and son of the then Justice Wayne of the Supreme Court. But these hastily retreated east across the Oconee River, leaving us a good bridge, which we promptly secured. 
At Milledgeville we found newspapers from all the South and learned the consternation which had filled the Southern mind at our temerity, many charging that we were actually fleeing for our lives and seeking safety at the hands of our fleet on the sea coast. All demanded that we should be assailed, front, flank, and rear, that provisions should be destroyed in advance so that we should starve, that bridges should be burned, roads obstructed, and no mercy shown us. Judging from the tone of the southern press of that day, the outside world must have supposed us ruined and lost. I give a few of these appeals as samples, which today must sound strange to the parties who made them. Corinth, Mississippi, November 18, 1884. To the people of Georgia, arise for the defense of your native soil. Rally around your patriotic governor and gallant soldiers. Obstruct and destroy all the roads in Sherman's front, flank, and rear, and his army will soon starve in your midst. Be confident, be resolute, trust in an overruling providence, and success will soon crown your efforts. I hasten to join you in the defense of your home and firesides. G. T. Beauregard. Richmond, November 18, 1884. To the people of Georgia. You have now the best opportunity ever yet presented to destroy the enemy. Put everything at the disposal of our generals, remove all provisions from the path of the invader, and put all obstructions in his path. Every citizen with his gun and every negro with his spade and axe can do the work of a soldier. You can destroy the enemy by retarding his march. Georgians, be firm, act promptly, and fear not. B. H. Hill, Senator. I most cordially approve the above. James A. Seddon, Secretary of War. Richmond, November 19, 1864, to the people of Georgia. We have had a special conference with President Davis and the Secretary of War, and are able to assure you that they have done and are still doing all that can be done to meet the emergency that presses upon you. Let every man fly to arms. Remove your negroes, horses, cattle, and provisions from Sherman's army, and burn what you cannot carry. Burn all bridges and block up the roads in his route. Assail the invader in front, flank, and rear, by night and by day. Let him have no rest. Julian Hartridge, Mark Blandford, J. H. Eccles, George N. Lester, John T. Shoemaker, James M. Smith, Members of Congress. Of course, we were rather amused than alarmed at these threats, and made light of the feeble opposition offered to our progress. Some of the officers, in the spirit of mischief, gathered together in the vacant hall of representatives, elected a speaker, and constituted themselves the legislature of the state of Georgia. A proposition was made to repeal the Ordinance of Secession, which was well debated and resulted in its repeal by a fair vote. I was not present at these frolics, but heard of them at the time, and enjoyed the joke. Meantime, orders were made for the total destruction of the arsenal and its contents, and of such public buildings as could be easily converted to hostile uses. But little or no damage was done to private property, and General Slocum, with my approval, spared several mills and many thousands of bales of cotton, taking what he knew to be worthless bonds, that the cotton should not be used for the Confederacy. Meantime, the right wing continued its movement along the railroad toward Savannah, tearing up the track and destroying its iron. At the Okony was met a feeble resistance from Harry Wayne's troops, but soon the pontoon bridge was laid and that wing crossed over. Gilpatrick's cavalry was brought into Milledgeville and crossed the Okony by the bridge near the town, and on the 23rd I made the general orders for the next stage of the march as far as Millen. They were substantially for the right wing to follow the Savannah Railroad by roads on its south. The left wing was to move to Sandersville by Davisboro and Louisville, while the cavalry was ordered by a circuit to the north and to march rapidly for Millen to rescue our prisoners of war confined there. The distance was about a hundred miles. General Wheeler, with his division of rebel cavalry, had succeeded in getting ahead of us between Milledgeville and Augusta, and General P. J. Hardy had been dispatched by General Beauregard from Hood's army to oppose our progress directly in front. 
He had, however, brought with him no troops, but relied on his influence with the Georgians, of whose state he was a native, to arouse the people and with them to annihilate Sherman's army. On the 24th we renewed the march, and I accompanied the 20th Corps, which took the direct road to Sandersville, which we reached simultaneously with the 14th Corps on the 26th. A brigade of rebel cavalry was deployed before the town, and was driven in and through it by our skirmish line. I myself saw the rebel cavalry apply fire to stacks of fodder standing in the fields at Sandersville, and gave orders to burn some unoccupied dwellings close by. On entering the town I told certain citizens, who would be sure to spread the report, that if the enemy attempted to carry out their threat to burn their food, corn, and fodder in our route, I would most undoubtedly execute to the letter the general orders of devastation made at the outset of the campaign. With this exception, and one or two minor cases near Savannah, the people did not destroy food, for they clearly saw that it would be ruin to themselves. At Sandersville I halted the left wing until I heard that the right wing was abreast of us on the railroad. During the evening a negro was brought to me who had that day been to the station, to kneel, about six miles south of the town. I inquired of him if there were any Yankees there, and he answered yes. He described in his own way what he had seen. First there come along some cavalrymen, and they burned the depot, then come along some infantrymen, and they tore up the track and burned it, and just before he left they had sought fire to the well. The next morning, viz. the 27th, I rode down to the station and found General Corse's division of the 15th Corps engaged in destroying the railroad, and saw the well which my negro informant had seen burnt. It was a square pit about twenty-five feet deep, boarded up with wooden steps leading to the bottom, wherein was a fine copper pump, to lift the water to a tank above. The soldiers had broken up the pump, heaved in the steps and lining, and set fire to the mass of lumber in the bottom of the well, which corroborated the negro's description. From this point Blair's Corps, the 17th, took up the work of destroying the railroad, the 15th Corps following another road leading eastward, farther to the south of the railroad. While the left wing was marching toward Louisville, north of the railroad, General Kilpatrick had, with his cavalry division, moved rapidly toward Waynesboro on the branch railroad leading from Millen to Augusta. He found Wheeler's division of rebel cavalry there, and had considerable skirmishing with it, but learning that our prisoners had been removed two days before from Millen, he returned to Louisville on the 29th, where he found the left wing. Here he remained a couple of days to rest his horses, and receiving orders from me to engage Wheeler and give him all the fighting he wanted, he procured from General Slocum the assistance of the infantry division of General Baird, and moved back for Waynesboro on the 2nd of December, the remainder of the left wing continuing its march on towards Miller's. Near Waynesboro, Wheeler was again encountered and driven through the town and beyond Briar Creek toward Augusta, thus keeping up the delusion that the main army was moving toward Augusta. General Kilpatrick's fighting and movement about Waynesboro and Briar Creek were spirited and produced a good effect by relieving the infantry column and the wagon trains of all molestation during their march on Millen. Having thus covered that flank, he turned south and followed the movement of the 14th Corps to Buckhead Church, north of Millen, and near it. On the 3rd of December, I entered Millen with the 17th Corps, General Frank P. Blair, and there paused one day to communicate with all parts of the army. General Howard was south of the Ogeechee River with the 15th Corps opposite Scarborough. General Slocum was at Buckhead Church, four miles north of Millen, with the 20th Corps. The 14th, General Davis, was at Lumpkin Station on the Augusta Road, about ten miles north of Millen, and the cavalry division was within easy support of this wing. Thus the whole army was in good position and in good condition. We had largely subsisted on the country. Our wagons were full of forage and provisions, but as we approached the sea coast, the country became more sandy and barren, and food became more scarce. Still, with little or no loss, we had traveled two-thirds of our distance, and I concluded to push on for Savannah. 
At Millen I learned that General Bragg was in Augusta and that General Wade Hampton had been ordered there from Richmond to organize a large cavalry force with which to resist our progress. General Hardy was ahead, between us and Savannah, with McLaw's division and other irregular troops that could not, I felt assured, exceed ten thousand men. I caused the fine depot at Millen to be destroyed and other damage done, and then resumed the march directly on Savannah by the four main roads. The 17th Corps, General Blair, followed substantially the railroad, and along with it on the 5th of December I reached Ogeechee Church about 50 miles from Savannah, and found there fresh earthworks which had been thrown up by McClaw's division. But he must have seen that both his flanks were being turned, and prudently retreated to Savannah without a fight. All the columns then pursued leisurely their march toward Savannah, corn and forage becoming more and more scarce, but rice fields beginning to occur along the Savannah and Ogeechee rivers, which proved a good substitute both as food and forage. The weather was fine, the roads good, and everything seemed to favor us. Never do I recall a more agreeable sensation than the sight of our camps by night, lit up by the fires of fragrant pine knots, the trains were all in good order, and the men seemed to march their fifteen miles a day as though it were nothing. No enemy opposed us, and we could only occasionally hear the faint reverberation of a gun to our left rear, where we knew that General Kilpatrick was skirmishing with Wheeler's cavalry, which persistently followed him. But the infantry columns had met with no opposition whatsoever. McClaw's division was falling back before us, and we occasionally picked up a few of his men as prisoners, who insisted that we would meet with strong opposition at Savannah. On the 8th, as I rode along, I found the column turned out of the main road, marching through the fields. Close by, in the corner of a fence, was a group of men standing around a handsome young officer, whose foot had been blown to pieces by a torpedo planted in the road. He was waiting for a surgeon to amputate his leg, and told me that he was riding along with the rest of his brigade staff of the 17th Corps, when a torpedo trodden on by his horse had exploded, killing the horse and literally blowing off all the flesh from one of his legs. I saw the terrible wound and made full inquiry into the facts. There had been no resistance at that point, nothing to give warning of danger, and the rebels had planted eight-inch shells in the road with friction matches to explode them by being trodden on. This was not war, but murder, and it made me very angry. I immediately ordered a lot of rebel prisoners to be brought from the provost guard, armed with picks and spades, and made them march in close order along the road, so as to explode their own torpedoes, or to discover and dig them up. They begged hard, but I reiterated the order, and could hardly help laughing at their stepping so gingerly along the road, where it was supposed sunken torpedoes might explode at each step but they found no other torpedoes till near Fort McAllister. That night we reached Pooler Station, eight miles from Savannah, and during the next two days, December 9th and 10th, the several corps reached the defenses of Savannah, the 14th Corps on the left, touching the river, the 20th Corps next, then the 17th, and the 15th on the extreme right, thus completely investing the city. Wishing to reconnoiter the place in person, I rode forward by the Louisville Road into a dense wood of oak, pine, and cypress, left the horses, and walked down to the railroad track at a place where there was a side track and a cut about four feet deep. From that point the railroad was straight, leading into Savannah, and about 800 yards off were a rebel parapet and battery. I could see the cannoneers preparing to fire, and cautioned the officers near me to scatter, as we would likely attract a shot. Very soon I saw the white puff of smoke, and watching close caught sight of the ball as it rose in its flight, and finding it coming pretty straight, I stepped a short distance to one side, but noticed a negro very near me in the act of crossing the track at right angles. Someone called to him to look out, but before the poor fellow understood his danger, the ball, a thirty-two pound round shot, struck the ground and rose in its first ricochet, caught the negro under the right jaw, and literally carried away his head, scattering blood and brains about. 
A soldier close by spread an overcoat over the body, and we all concluded to get out of that railroad cut. Meantime, General Mower's division of the 17th Corps had crossed the canal to the right of the Louisville Road and had found the line of parapet continuous, so at Savannah we had again run up against the old familiar parapet with its deep ditches, canals, and bayous full of water, and it looked as though another siege was inevitable. I accordingly made a camp or bivouac near the Louisville Road, about five miles from Savannah, and proceeded to invest the place closely, pushing forward reconnaissances at every available point. As soon as it was demonstrated that Savannah was well fortified, with a good garrison, commanded by General William J. Hardy, a competent soldier, I saw that the first step was to open communication with our fleet, supposed to be waiting for us with supplies and clothing, in Osabao Sound. General Howard had, some nights previously, sent one of his best scouts, Captain Duncan, with two men, in a canoe, to drift past Fort McAllister and to convey to the fleet a knowledge of our approach. General Kilpatrick's cavalry had also been transferred to the south bank of the Ogeechee with orders to open communication with the fleet. Leaving orders with General Slocum to press the siege, I instructed General Howard to send a division with all his engineers to Grog's Bridge, fourteen and a half miles southwest from Savannah, to rebuild it. On the evening of the 12th, I rode over myself and spent the night at Mr. King's house, where I found General Howard with General Hazen's division of the 15th Corps. His engineers were hard at work on the bridge, which they finished that night, and at sunrise Hazen's division crossed over. I gave General Hazen, in person, his orders to march rapidly down the right bank of the Ogeechee, and without hesitation to assault and carry Fort McAllister by storm. I knew it to be strong in heavy artillery as against an approach from the sea, but believed it open and weak to the rear. I explained to General Hazen, fully, that on his action depended the safety of the whole army and the success of the campaign. Kilpatrick had already felt the fort and had gone farther down the coast to Kilkenny Bluff, or St. Catherine Sound, where on the same day he had communication with a vessel belonging to the blockading fleet. But at the time I was not aware of this fact, and trusted entirely to General Hazen and his division of infantry, the second of the 15th Corps, the same old division which I had commanded at Shiloh and Vicksburg, in which I felt a special pride and confidence. Having seen General Hazen fairly off, accompanied by General Howard, I rode with my staff down the left bank of the Ogeechee, ten miles to the rice plantation of a Mr. Chivia, where General Howard had established a signal station to overlook the lower river, and to watch for any vessel of the blockading squadron, which the Negroes reported to be expecting us, because they nightly sent up rockets and daily dispatched a steamboat up the Ogeechee as near to Fort McAllister as it was safe. On reaching the rice mill at Chivia's, I found a guard and a couple of twenty-pound parrot gone of de Grease's battery, which fired an occasional shot toward Fort McAllister, plainly seen over the salt marsh about three miles distant. Fort McAllister had the rebel flag flying, and occasionally sent a heavy shot back across the marsh to where we were, but otherwise everything about the place looked as peaceable and quiet as on the Sabbath. The signal officer had built a platform on the ridge pole of the rice mill. Leaving our horses behind the stacks of rice straw, we all got on the roof of a shed attached to the mill, wherefrom I could communicate with the signal officer above, and at the same time look out toward Osaba Sound and across the Ogeechee River at Fort McAllister. About 2 p.m. we observed signs of commotion in the fort, and noticed one or two guns fired inland and some musket skirmishing in the woods close by. This betokened the approach of Hazen's division, which had been anxiously expected, and soon thereafter the signal officer discovered about three miles above the fort a signal flag with which he conversed and found it to belong to General Hazen, who was preparing to assault the fort and wanted to know if I were there. On being assured of this fact, and that I expected the fort to be carried before night, 
I received by signal the assurance of General Hazen that he was making his preparations and would soon attempt the assault. The sun was rapidly declining and I was dreadfully impatient. At that very moment someone discovered a faint cloud of smoke and an object gliding, as it were, along the horizon above the tops of the sedge toward the sea, which little by little grew till it was pronounced to be the smokestack of a steamer coming up the river. It must be one of our squadron. Soon the flag of the United States was plainly visible, and our attention was divided between this approaching steamer and the expected assault. When the sun was about an hour high, another signal message came from General Hazen that he was all ready, and I replied to go ahead, as a friendly steamer was approaching from below. Soon we made out a group of officers on the deck of the vessel signaling with a flag. Who are you? The answer went back promptly, General Sherman. Then followed the question, Is Fort McAllister taken? Not yet, but it will be in a minute. Almost at that instant of time, we saw Hazen's troop come out of the dark fringe of woods that encompassed the fort, the lines dressed as on parade, with colors flying and moving forward with a quick, steady pace. Fort McAllister was then all alive, its big guns belching forth dense clouds of smoke, which soon enveloped our assaulting lines. One color went down, but was up in a moment. On the lines advanced, faintly seen in the white sulfurous smoke, there was a pause, a sensation of fire. The smoke cleared away, and the parapets were blue with our men, who fired their muskets in the air, and shouted so that we actually heard them, or felt that we did. Fort McAllister was taken, and the good news was instantly sent by the signal officer to our Navy friends on the approaching gunboat, for a point of timber had shut out Fort McAllister from their view, and they had not seen the action at all, but must have heard the cannonading. During the progress of the assault, our little group on Cheevy's mill hardly breathed, but no sooner did we see our flags on the parapet than I exclaimed, in the language of the poor negro at Cobb's plantation, "'This nigger will have no sleep this night!' I was resolved to communicate with our fleet that night, which happened to be a beautiful moonlit one. At the wharf belonging to Cheevy's Mill was a smaller skiff that had been used by our men in fishing or in gathering oysters. I was there in a minute, called for a volunteer crew, when several young officers, Nichols and Merritt among the number, said they were good oarsmen and volunteered to pull the boat down to Fort McAllister. General Howard asked to accompany me, so we took seats in the stern of the boat, and our crew of officers pulled out with a will. The tide was setting in strong, and they had a hard pull, for, though the distance was but three miles in an air line, the river was so crooked that the actual distance was fully six miles. On the way down we passed the wreck of a steamer which had been sunk some years before during a naval attack on Fort McAllister. Night had fairly set in when we discovered a soldier on the beach. I hailed him and inquired if he knew where General Hazen was. He answered that the general was at the house of the overseer of the plantation, McAllister's, and that he could guide me to it. We accordingly landed, tied our boat to a drift log, and followed our guide through bushes to a frame house standing in a grove of live oaks near a row of negro quarters. General Hazen was there with his staff in the act of getting supper. He invited us to join them, which we accepted promptly, for we were really very hungry. Of course I congratulated Hazen most heartily on his brilliant success, and praised its execution very highly as it deserved, and he explained to me more in detail the exact results. The fort was an enclosed work, and its land front was in the nature of a bastion and curtains, with a good parapet, ditch, fraise, and chevaux de frise made out of the large branches of live oaks. Luckily, the rebels had left the larger and unwieldy trunks on the ground, which served as good cover for the skirmish line, which crept behind these logs, and from them kept the artillerists from loading and firing their guns accurately. The assault had been made by three parties in line, one from below, one from above the fort, and the third directly in rear, along the capital. 
all were simultaneous and had to pass a good abatis and line of torpedoes which actually killed more of the assailants than the heavy guns of the fort which generally overshot the mark hazen's entire loss was reported killed and wounded ninety two each party reached the parapet about the same time and the garrison inside of about two hundred and fifty men about fifty of them killed or wounded were in his power the commanding officer major anderson was at that moment a prisoner and general hazen invited him in to take supper with us which he did up to this time general hazen did not know that a gunboat was in the river below the fort for it was shut off from sight by a point of timber and i was determined to board her that night at whatever risk or cost as i wanted some news of what was going on in the outer world accordingly after supper we all walked down to the fort nearly a mile from the house where we had been entered fort mcallister held by a regiment of hazen's troops and the sentinel cautioned us to be very careful as the ground outside the fort was full of torpedoes indeed while we were there a torpedo exploded tearing to pieces a poor fellow who was hunting for a dead comrade inside the fort lay the dead as they had fallen and they could hardly be distinguished from their living comrades sleeping soundly side by side in the pale moonlight in the river close by the fort was a good yawl tied to a stake but the tide was high and it required some time to get it into the bank the commanding officer whose name i cannot recall manned the boat with a good crew of his men and with general howard i entered and pulled down stream regardless of the warnings all about the torpedoes the night was unusually bright and we expected to find the gunboat within a mile or so but after pulling down the river fully three miles and not seeing the gunboat i began to think she had turned and gone back to the sound but we kept on following the bends of the river and about six miles below mcallister we saw her light and soon were hailed by the vessel at anchor pulling alongside we announced ourselves and were received with great warmth and enthusiasm on deck by half a dozen naval officers among them captain williamson united states navy she proved to be the dandelion a tender of the regular gunboat flag posted at the mouth of the ogeechee all sorts of questions were made and answered and we learned that captain duncan had safely reached the squadron had communicated the good news of our approach and they had been expecting us for some days they explained that admiral dahlgren commanded the south atlantic squadron which was then engaged in blockading the coast from charleston south and was on his flagship the harvest moon lying in wasaw sound that general j g foster was in command of the department of the south with his headquarters at hilton head and that several ships loaded with stores for the army were lying at tybee roads and in port royal sound from these officers i also learned that general grant was still besieging petersburg and richmond and that matters and things generally remained pretty much the same as when we had left atlanta all thoughts seemed to have been turned to us in georgia cut off from all communication with our friends and the rebel papers had reported us to be harassed defeated starving and fleeing for safety to the coast i then asked for pen and paper and wrote several hasty notes to general foster admiral dahlgren general grant and the secretary of war giving in general terms the actual state of affairs the fact of the capture of fort mcallister and of my desire that means should be taken to establish a line of supply from the vessels in port up the ogeechee to the rear of the army as a sample i give one of these notes addressed to the secretary of war intended for publication to relieve the anxiety of our friends at the north generally on board dandelion osabo sound december thirteenth eighteen sixty four eleven fifty p m to hon e m stanton secretary of war washington d c Today at 6 p.m., General Hazen's division of the 15th Corps carried Fort McAllister by assault, capturing its entire garrison and stores. This opened to us Osabo Sound, and I pushed down to this gunboat to communicate with the fleet. Before opening communication, we had completely destroyed all the railroads leading into Savannah and invested the city. 
The left of the army was on the Savannah River, three miles above the city, and the right on the Ogeechee at King's Bridge. The army is in splendid order and equal to anything. The weather has been fine and supplies were abundant. Our march was most agreeable and we were not at all molested by guerrillas. We reached Savannah three days ago, but owing to Fort McAllister could not communicate. But now that we have McAllister, we can go ahead. We have already captured two boats on the Savannah River and prevented their gunboats from coming down. I estimate the population of Savannah at 25,000 and the garrison at 15,000. General Hardy commands. We have not lost a wagon on the trip, but have gathered a large supply of negroes, mules, horses, etc., and our teams are in far better condition than when we started. My first duty will be to clear the army of surplus negroes, mules, and horses. We have utterly destroyed over 200 miles of rails and consumed stores and provisions that were essential to Lee's and Hood's armies. The quick work made with McAllister, the opening of communication with our fleet, and our consequent independence as to supplies dissipate all their boasted threats to head us off and starve the army. I regard Savannah as already gained. Yours truly, W. T. Sherman, Major General. By this time the night was well advanced, and the tide was running ebb strong. So I asked Captain Williamson to tow us up as near Fort McAllister as he would venture for the torpedoes, of which the Navy officers had a wholesome dread. The dandelion steamed up three or four miles till the lights of Fort McAllister could be seen, when she anchored, and we pulled to the fort in our own boat. General Howard and I then walked up to the McAllister house, where we found General Hazen and his officers asleep on the floor of one of the rooms. Lying down on the floor, I was soon fast asleep, but shortly became conscious that someone in the room was inquiring for me among the sleepers. Calling out, I was told that an officer of General Foster's staff had just arrived from a steamboat anchored below McAllister, that the general was extremely anxious to see me on important business, but that he was lame from an old Mexican war wound and could not possibly come to me. I was extremely weary from the incessant labor of the day and night before, but got up and again walked down the sandy road to McAllister, where I found a boat awaiting us, which carried us some three miles down the river to the steamer W. W. Coit, I think, on board of which we found General Foster. He had just come from Port Royal, expecting to find Admiral Dahlgren in Osibo Sound, and hearing of the capture of Fort McAllister, he had come to see me. He described fully the condition of affairs with his own command in South Carolina. He had made several serious efforts to effect a lodgment on the railroad which connects Savannah with Charleston near Poco Taligo, but had not succeeded in reaching the railroad itself, though he had a full division of troops strongly entrenched near Broad River within cannon range of the railroad. He explained, moreover, that there were at Port Royal abundant supplies of bread and provisions, as well as of clothing, designed for our use. We still had in our wagons and in camp abundance of meat, but we needed bread, sugar, and coffee, and it was all-important that a route of supply should at once be opened, for which purpose the assistance of the Navy were indispensable. We accordingly steamed down the Ogeechee River to Osobo Sound in hopes to meet Admiral Dahlgren, but he was not there, and we continued on by the inland channel to Warsaw Sound, where we found the Harvest Moon and Admiral Dahlgren. I was not personally acquainted with him at the time, but he was so extremely kind and courteous that I was at once attracted to him. There was nothing in his power, he said, which he would not do to assist us to make our campaign absolutely successful. He undertook at once to find vessels of light draft to carry our supplies from Port Royal to Cheevy's Mill, or to Grog's Bridge above, whence they could be hauled by wagons to our several camps. He offered to return with me to Fort McAllister to superintend the removal of the torpedoes and to relieve me of all the details of this most difficult work. 
General Foster then concluded to go to Port Royal to send back to us 600,000 rations and all the rifled guns of heavy caliber and ammunition on hand, with which I thought we could reach the city of Savannah, from the positions already secured. Admiral Dahlgren then returned with me in the Harvest Moon to Fort McAllister. This consumed all of the 14th of December, and by the 15th I had again reached Cheevy's Mill, where my horse awaited me, and rode on to General Howard's headquarters at Anderson's Plantation, on the Plank Road, about eight miles back of Savannah. I reached this place about noon, and immediately sent orders by my own headquarters on the Louisville Road to have them brought over to the Plank Road as a place more central and convenient. Gave written notice to General Slocum and Howard of all the steps taken, and ordered them to get ready to receive the siege guns, to put them in position to bombard Savannah, and to prepare for the general assault. The country back of Savannah is very low, and intersected with innumerable saltwater creeks, swamps, and rice fields. Fortunately, the weather was good, and the roads were passable, but should the winter rain set in, I knew that we would be much embarrassed. Therefore, heavy details of men were at once put to work to prepare a wharf and depot at Grog's Bridge, and the roads leading thereto were corduroyed in advance. The Ogeechee Canal was also cleared out for use, and boats, such as were common on the river plantations, were collected in which to float stores from our proposed base on the Ogeechee to the points most convenient to the several camps. Slocum's wing extended from the Savannah River to the canal, and Howard's wing from the canal to the extreme right, along down the Little Ogeechee. The enemy occupied not only the city itself, with its long line of outer works, but the many forts which had been built to guard the approaches from the sea, such as Boileau, Rosedew, White Bluff, Bonaventura, Thunderbolt, Canston's Bluff, forts, Tatnall, bogs, etc., etc. I knew that General Harder could not have a garrison strong enough for all these purposes, and I was therefore anxious to break his lines before he could receive reinforcements from Virginia or Augusta. General Slocum had already captured a couple of steamboats trying to pass down the Savannah River from Augusta, and had established some of his men on Argyle and Hutchinson Islands above the city, and wanted to transfer a whole corps to the South Carolina bank. But as the enemy had ironclad gunboats in the river, I did not deem it prudent, because the same result could be better accomplished from General Foster's position at Broad River. Fort McAllister was captured, as described, late in the evening of December 13th, and by the 16th many steamboats had passed up as high as King's Bridge, among them one which General Grant had dispatched with the mails for the army, which had accumulated since our departure from Atlanta under charge of Colonel A. H. Markland. These mails were most welcome to all the officers and soldiers of the army, which had been cut off from friends and the world for two months, and this prompt receipt of letters from home had an excellent effect, making us feel that home was near. By this vessel also came Lieutenant Dune, aide-de-camp, with the following letter of December 3rd from General Grant, and on the next day Colonel Babcock, United States Engineers, arrived with the letter of December 6th, both of which are in General Grant's own handwriting and are given entire. Headquarters, Armies of the United States, City Point, Virginia, December 3, 1864. Major General W.T. Sherman, Commanding Armies near Savannah, Georgia. General, the little information gleaned from the Southern press indicating no great obstacle to your progress, I have directed your mails, which had been previously collected at Baltimore by Colonel Markland, Special Agent of the Post Office Department, to be sent as far as the blockading squadron off Savannah, to be forwarded to you as soon as heard from on the coast. Not liking to rejoice before the victory is assured, I abstain from congratulating you and those under your command until bottom has been struck. I have never had a fear, however, for the result. Since you left Atlanta, no very great progress has been made here. The enemy has been closely watched, though, and prevented from detaching against you. 
I think not one man has gone from here except some twelve or fifteen hundred dismounted cavalry. Bragg has gone from Wilmington. I am trying to take advantage of his absence to get possession of that place. Owing to some preparations Admiral Porter and General Butler are making to blow up Fort Fisher, which, while hoping for the best, I do not believe a particle in, there is a delay in getting this expedition off. I hope they will be ready to start by the 7th, and that Bragg will not have started back by that time. In this letter I do not intend to give you anything like directions for future action, but will state a general idea I have, and will get your views after you have established yourself on the sea coast. With your veteran army I hope to get control of the only two through routes from east to west possessed by the enemy before the fall of Atlanta. The condition will be filled by holding Savannah and Augusta, or by holding any other port to the east of Savannah and Branchville. If Wilmington falls, a force from there can cooperate with you. Thomas has got back into the defenses of Nashville, with Hood close upon him. Decatur has been abandoned, and so have all the roads, except the main one leading to Chattanooga. Part of this falling back was undoubtedly necessary, and all of it may have been. It did not look so, however, to me. In my opinion, Thomas far outnumbers Hood in infantry. In cavalry, Hood has the advantage in morale and numbers. I hope yet that Hood will be badly crippled, if not destroyed. The general news you will learn from the papers better than I can give it. After all becomes quiet and roads become so bad up here that there is likely to be a week or two when nothing can be done, I will run down the coast to see you. If you desire it, I will ask Mrs. Sherman to go with me. Yours truly, U.S. Grant, Lieutenant General. Headquarters of the Armies of the United States, City Point, Virginia, December 6, 1864. Major General W.T. Sherman, Commanding Military Division of the Mississippi. General, on reflection since sending my letter by the hands of Lieutenant Dunn, I have concluded that the most important operation toward closing out the rebellion will be to close out Lee and his army. You have now destroyed the roads of the South so that it will probably take them three months without interruption to re-establish a through line from east to west. In that time, I think the job here will be effectually completed. My idea now is that you establish a base on the sea coast, fortify and leave in it all your artillery and cavalry and enough infantry to protect them, and at the same time to threaten the interior that the militia of the South will have to be kept at home. With the balance of your command, come here by water with all dispatch. Select yourself the officer to leave in command, but you I want in person. Unless you see objections to this plan, which I cannot see, use every vessel going to you for purposes of transportation. Hood has Thomas close in Nashville. I have said all I can to force him to attack without giving the positive order until today. Today, however, I could stand it no longer and gave the order without any reserve. I think the battle will take place tomorrow. The result will probably be known in New York before Colonel Babcock, the bearer of this, will leave it. Colonel Babcock will give you full information of all operations now in progress. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, U.S. Grant, Lieutenant General. The contents of these letters gave me great uneasiness, for I had set my heart on the capture of Savannah, which I believed to be practicable and to be near. For me to embark for Virginia by sea was so complete a change from what I had supposed would be the course of events that I was very much concerned. I supposed, as a matter of course, that a fleet of vessels would soon pour in, ready to convey the army to Virginia, and as General Grant's orders contemplated my leaving the cavalry, trains, and artillery behind, I judged Fort McAllister to be the best place for the purpose, and sent my chief engineer, Colonel Poe, to that fort to reconnoitre the ground and to prepare it so as to make a fortified camp large enough to accommodate the vast herd of mules and horses that would thus be left behind. 
and as some time might be required to collect the necessary shipping, which I estimated at little less than a hundred steamers and sailing vessels, I determined to push operations in hopes to secure the city of Savannah before the necessary fleet could be available. All these ideas are given in my answer to General Grant's letters, dated December 16, 1864, herewith, which is a little more full than the one printed in the report of the Committee on the Conduct of the War, because in that copy I omitted the matter concerning General Thomas, which now need no longer be withheld. Headquarters, Military Division of the Mississippi in the Field, near Savannah, December 16, 1864. Lieutenant General U.S. Grant, Commander-in-Chief, City Point, Virginia. General, I received day before yesterday at the hands of Lieutenant Dunn your letter of December 8th, and last night at the hands of Colonel Babcock that of December 6th. I had previously made you a hasty scrawl from the tugboat Dandelion in Ogeechee River, advising you that the Army had reached the sea coast, destroying all the railroads across the state of Georgia, investing closely the city of Savannah, and had made connection with the fleet. Since writing that note, I have in person met and conferred with General Foster and Admiral Dahlgren, and made all the arrangements which were deemed essential for reducing the city of Savannah to our possession. But since the receipt of yours of the 6th, I have initiated measures looking principally to coming to you with fifty or 60,000 infantry, and incidentally to capture Savannah, if time will allow." At the time we carried Fort McAllister by assault so handsomely, with its twenty-two guns and entire garrison, I was hardly aware of its importance. But since passing down the river with General Foster and up with Admiral Dahlgren, I realize how admirably adapted are Osabao Sound and Ogeechee River to supply an army operating against Savannah. Seagoing vessels can easily come to King's Bridge, a point on Ogeechee River, fourteen and a half miles due west of Savannah, from which point we have roads leading to all our camps. The country is low and sandy and cut up with marshes, which in wet weather will be very bad, but we have been so favored with weather that they are all now comparatively good, and heavy details are constantly employed in double corduroying the marshes, so that I have no fears even of bad weather. Fortunately also, by liberal and judicious foraging, we reach the sea coast abundantly supplied with forage and provisions, needing nothing on arrival except bread. Of this we started from Atlanta with from eight to twenty days' supply per corps, and some of the troops only had one day's issue of bread during the trip of thirty days. Yet they did not want, for sweet potatoes were very abundant, as well as corn meal, and our soldiers took to them naturally. We started with about 5,000 head of cattle and arrived with over 10,000, of course consuming mostly turkeys, chickens, sheep, hogs, and the cattle of the country. As to our mules and horses, we left Atlanta with about 2,500 wagons, many of which were drawn by mules which had not recovered from the Chattanooga starvation, all of which were replaced, the poor mules shot, and our transportation is now in superb condition. I have no doubt the state of Georgia has lost, by our operations, 15,000 first-rate mules. As to horses, Kilpatrick collected all his remounts, and it looks to me, in riding along our columns, as though every officer had three or four led horses, and each regiment seems to be followed by at least 50 Negroes and foot-sore soldiers riding on horses and mules. The custom was for each brigade to send out daily a foraging party of about fifty men on foot, who invariably return mounted with several wagons loaded with poultry, potatoes, etc., and as the army is composed of about forty brigades, you can estimate approximately the number of horses collected. Great numbers of these were shot by my order because of the disorganizing effect on our infantry of having too many idlers mounted. General Houston is now engaged in collecting statistics on this subject, but I know the government will never receive full accounts of our captures, although the result aimed at was fully attained, viz. to deprive our enemy of them. 
All these animals I will have sent to Port Royal or collected behind Fort McAllister to be used by General Saxton in his farming operations or by the quartermaster's department after they are systematically accounted for. While General Easton is collecting transportation for my troops to James River, I will throw to Port Royal Island all our means of transportation I can and collect the rest near Fort McAllister, covered by the Ogeechee River and entrenchments to be erected, and for which Captain Poe, my chief engineer, is now reconnoitering the ground, but in the meantime will act as I have begun, as though the city of Savannah were my objective, namely the troops will continue to invest Savannah closely, making attacks and feints wherever we have fair ground to stand upon, and I will place some thirty-pound parrots, which I have got from General Foster, in position near enough to reach the center of the city, and then will demand its surrender." If General Hardy is alarmed or fears starvation, he may surrender. Otherwise, I will bombard the city, but not risk the lives of our men by assaults across the narrow causeways, by which alone I can now reach it. If I had time, Savannah, with all its dependent fortifications, would surely fall into our possession, for we hold all its avenues of supply." the enemy has made two desperate efforts to get boats from above to the city in both of which he has been foiled general slocum whose left flank rests on the river capturing and burning the first boat and in the second instance driving back two gunboats and capturing the steamer resolute with seven naval officers and a crew of twenty-five seamen General Slocum occupies Argyle Island and the upper end of Hutchinson Island, and has a brigade on the South Carolina shore opposite, and is very urgent to pass one of his corps over to that shore. But in view of the change of plan made necessary by your order of the 6th, I will maintain things in statu quo till I have got all my transportation to the rear and out of the way, and until I have sea transportation for the troops you require at James River, which I will accompany and command in person. Of course, I will leave Kilpatrick with his cavalry, say 5,300, and it may be a division of the 15th Corps, but before determining on this I must see General Foster, and may arrange to shift his force, now over above the Charleston Railroad at the head of Broad River, to the Ogeechee, where, in cooperation with Kilpatrick's cavalry, he can better threaten the state of Georgia than from the direction of Port Royal. Besides, I would much prefer not to detach from my regular corps any of its veteran divisions, and would even prefer that other less valuable troops should be sent to reinforce Foster from some other quarter." My four corps, full of experience and full of ardor, coming to you en masse, equal to 60,000 fighting men, will be a reinforcement that Lee cannot disregard. Indeed, with my present command, I can expect, after reducing Savannah, instantly to march to Columbia, South Carolina, thence to Raleigh, and thence to report to you. But this would consume, it may be, six weeks' time after the fall of Savannah, whereas by sea I can probably reach you with my men and arms before the middle of January. I myself am somewhat astonished at the attitude of things in Tennessee. I purposely delayed at Kingston until General Thomas assured me that he was all ready, and my last dispatch from him of the 12th of November was full of confidence, in which he promised me that he would ruin Hood if he dared to advance from Florence, urging me to go ahead and give myself no concern about Hood's army in Tennessee. Why he did not turn on him at Franklin, after checking and discomfiting him, surpasses my understanding. Indeed, I do not approve of his evacuating Decatur, but think he should have assumed the offensive against Hood from Pulaski, in the direction of Waynesburg. I know full well that General Thomas is slow in mind and in action, but he is judicious and brave, and the troops feel great confidence in him. I still hope he will outmaneuver and destroy Hood. As to matters in the southeast, I think Hardy in Savannah has good artillerists, some five or six thousand good infantry, and it may be a mongrel mass of eight to ten thousand militia. 
In all our marching through Georgia, he has not forced us to use anything but a skirmish line, though at several points he had erected fortifications and tried to alarm us by bombastic threats. In Savannah he has taken refuge in a line constructed behind swamps and overflowed rice fields, extending from a point on the Savannah River about three miles above the city, around by a branch of the Little Ogeechee, which stream is impassable from its salt marshes and boggy swamps, crossed only by narrow causeways or common corduroy roads. There must be 25,000 citizens, men, women, and children in Savannah, that must also be fed, and how he is to feed them beyond a few days I cannot imagine. I know that his requisitions for corn on the interior counties were not fulfilled, and we are in possession of the rice fields and mills which could alone be of service to him in this neighborhood. He can draw nothing from South Carolina, save from a small corner down in the southeast, and that by a disused wagon road. I could easily get possession of this, but hardly deem it worth the risk of making a detachment which would be in danger by its isolation from the main army. Our whole army is in fine condition as to health, and the weather is splendid. For that reason alone I feel a personal dislike to turning northward. I will keep Lieutenant Dunn here until I know the result of my demand for the surrender of Savannah, but whether successful or not shall not delay my execution of your order of the 6th, which will depend alone upon the time it will require to obtain transportation by sea. I am, with respect, etc., your obedient servant, W.T. Sherman, Major General, United States Army. Having concluded all needful preparations, I rode from my headquarters on the Plank Road over to General Slocum's headquarters on the Macon Road, and thence dispatched by flag of truce into Savannah by the hands of Colonel Ewing, Inspector General, a demand for the surrender of the place. The following letters give the result. General Hardy refused to surrender, and I then resolved to make the attempt to break his line of defense at several places, trusting that someone would succeed. Headquarters, Military Division of the Mississippi, in the field, near Savannah, December 17, 1864. General William J. Hardy, commanding Confederate forces in Savannah. General you have doubtless observed from your station at Rosedew that sea-going vessels now come through Osabo Sound and up the Ogeechee to the rear of my army, giving me abundant supplies of all kinds, and more especially heavy ordnance necessary for the reduction of Savannah. I have already received guns that can cast heavy and destructive shot as far as the heart of your city." Also, I have for some days held and controlled every avenue by which the people and garrison of Savannah can be supplied, and I am therefore justified in demanding the surrender of the city of Savannah and its dependent forts, and shall wait a reasonable time for your answer before opening with heavy ordnance. Should you entertain the proposition, I am prepared to grant liberal terms to the inhabitants and garrison, but should I be forced to resort to assault or the slower and sure process of starvation, I shall then feel justified in resorting to the harshest measures and shall make little effort to restrain my army, burning to avenge the national wrong which they attach to Savannah and other large cities which have been so prominent in dragging our country into civil war. I enclose you a copy of General Hood's demand for the surrender of the town of Rizoa to be used by you for what it is worth. I have the honor to be your obedient servant, W.T. Sherman, Major General. Headquarters, Department, South Carolina, Georgia and Florida, Savannah, Georgia, December 17, 1864, Major General W.T. Sherman, commanding Federal Forces near Savannah, Georgia. General. I have to acknowledge the receipt of a communication from you of this date, in which you demand the surrender of Savannah and its dependent forts, on the ground that you have received guns that can cast heavy and destructive shot into the heart of the city, and for the further reason that you have, for some days, held and controlled every avenue by which the people and garrison can be supplied. 
You add that should you be forced to resort to assault or to the slower and surer process of starvation, you will then feel justified in resorting to the harshest measures and will make little effort to restrain your army, etc., etc. The position of your forces, a half mile beyond the outer line for the land defense of Savannah, is at the nearest point at least four miles from the heart of the city. That and the interior line are both intact. Your statement that you have for some days held and controlled every avenue by which the people and garrison can be supplied is incorrect. I am in free and constant communication with my department. Your demand for the surrender of Savannah and its dependent forts is refused. With respect to the threats conveyed in the closing paragraphs of your letter, of what may be expected in case your demand is not complied with, I have to say that I have hitherto conducted the military operations entrusted to my direction in strict accordance with the rules of civilized warfare, and I should deeply regret the adoption of any course by you that may force me to deviate from them in future. I have the honor to be, very respectfully, your obedient servant, W. J. Hardy, Lieutenant General. Headquarters, Military Division of the Mississippi in the Field, near Savannah, December 18, 1864, 8 p.m. Lieutenant General U. S. Grant, City Point, Virginia. General, I wrote you at length, by Colonel Babcock, on the 16th instant, as I therein explained my purpose, yesterday I made a demand on General Hardy for the surrender of the city of Savannah, and today received his answer, refusing. Copies of both letters are herewith enclosed. You will notice that I claim that my lines are within easy cannon range of the heart of Savannah, but General Hardy asserts that we are four and a half miles distant. But I myself have been to the intersection of the Charleston and Georgia Central Railroads, and the three-mile post is but a few yards beyond, within the line of our pickets. The enemy has no pickets outside of his fortified line, which is a full quarter of a mile within the three-mile post, and I have the evidence of Mr. R. R. Kyler, president of the Georgia Central Railroad, who was a prisoner in our hands, that the mile posts are measured from the exchange, which is but two squares back from the river. By tomorrow morning I will have six thirty-pound parrots in position, and General Hardy will learn whether I am right or wrong. From the left of our line, which is in the Savannah River, the spires can be plainly seen. But the country is so densely wooded with pine and live oak, and lies so flat, that we can see nothing from any other portion of our lines. General Slocum feels confident that he can make a successful assault at one or two points in front of General Davis's 14th Corps. All of General Howard's troops, the right wing, lie behind the little Ogeechee, and I doubt if it can be passed by troops in the face of an enemy. Still, we can make strong feints, and if I can get a sufficient number of boats, I shall make a cooperative demonstration up Vernon River or Warsaw Sound. I should like very much indeed to take Savannah before coming to you, but as I wrote to you before, I will do nothing rash or hasty, and will embark for the James River as soon as General Easton, who has gone to Port Royal for that purpose, reports to me that he has an approximate number of vessels for the transportation of the contemplated force. I fear even this will cost more delay than you anticipate, for already the movement of our transports and the gunboats has required more time than I had expected. We have had dense fogs, there are more mud banks on the Ogeechee than were reported, and there are no pilots whatever. Admiral Dahlgren promised to have the channel buoyed and staked, but it is not done yet. We find only six feet of water up to Kingsbridge at low tide, about ten feet up to the rice mill, and sixteen to Fort McAllister. All these points may be used by us, and we have a good strong bridge across Ogeechee at King's, by which our wagons can go to Fort McAllister, to which point I am sending all wagons not absolutely necessary for daily use, the Negroes, prisoners of war, sick, etc., en route for Port Royal. In relation to Savannah, you will remark that General Hardy refers to his still being in communication with his department. 
This language he thought would deceive me, but I am confirmed in the belief that the route to which he refers, the Union Plank Road on the South Carolina shore, is inadequate to feed his army and the people of Savannah, and General Foster assures me that he has his force on that very road near the head of Broad River, so that cars no longer run between Charleston and Savannah. We hold this end of the Charleston Railroad and have destroyed it from the three-mile post back to the bridge, about twelve miles. In anticipation of leaving this country, I am continuing the destruction of their railroads, and at this moment have two divisions and the cavalry at work breaking up the Gulf Railroad from the Ogeechee to the Altamaha, so that, even if I do not take Savannah, I will leave it in a bad way but I still hope that events may give me time to take Savannah, even if I have to assault with some loss. I am satisfied that unless we take it, the gunboats never will, for they can make no impression upon the batteries which guard every approach from the sea. I have a faint belief that when Colonel Babcock reaches you, you will delay operations long enough to enable me to succeed here." With Savannah in our possession, at some future time if not now, we can punish South Carolina as she deserves, and as thousands of the people in Georgia hoped we would do. I do sincerely believe that the whole United States, North and South, would rejoice to have this army turned loose on South Carolina to devastate that state in the manner we have done in Georgia, and it would have a direst and immediate bearing on your campaign in Virginia. I have the honor to be your obedient servant, W. T. Sherman, Major General, United States Army. As soon as the Army had reached Savannah and had opened communication with the fleet, I endeavored to ascertain what had transpired in Tennessee since our departure. We received our letters and files of newspapers, which contained full accounts of all the events there up to about the 1st of December. As before described, General Hood had three full corps of infantry, S. D. Lee's, A. P. Stewart's, and Chetham's, at Florence, Alabama, with Forrest's corps of cavalry, numbering in the aggregate about 45,000 men. General Thomas was in Nashville, Tennessee, quietly engaged in reorganizing his army out of the somewhat broken forces at his disposal. He had posted his only two regular corps, the 4th and 23rd, under the general command of Major General J. M. Schofield, at Pulaski, directly in front of Florence, with the three brigades of cavalry, Hatch, Croxton, and Capron, commanded by Major General Wilson, watching closely for Hood's initiative. This force aggregated about 30,000 men, and was therefore inferior to the enemy, and General Schofield was instructed, in case the enemy made a general advance, to fall back slowly toward Nashville, fighting till he should be reinforced by General Thomas in person. Hood's movement was probably hurried by reason of my advance into Georgia, for on the 17th his infantry columns marched from Florence in the direction of Waynesboro, turning Schofield's position at Pulaski. The latter at once sent his trains to the rear, and on the 21st fell back to Columbia, Tennessee. General Hood followed up this movement, skirmished lightly with Schofield at Columbia, began the passage of Duck River below the town, and Chetham's corps reached the vicinity of Spring Hill, whither General Schofield had sent General Stanley, with two of his divisions, to cover the movements of his trains. During the night of November 29th, General Schofield passed Spring Hill with his trains and army and took post at Franklin on the south side of Harbeth River. General Hood now attaches serious blame to General Chetham for not attacking General Schofield in flank while in motion at Spring Hill, for he was bivouacked within 800 yards of the road at the time of the passage of our army. General Schofield reached Franklin on the morning of November 30th and posted his army in front of the town, where some rifle entrenchments had been constructed in advance. He had the two corps of Stanley and Cox, 4th and 23rd, with Wilson's cavalry on his flanks, and sent his trains behind the Harpeth. General Hood closed upon him the same day, and assaulted his position with vehemence, at one time breaking the line and wounding General Stanley seriously. 
But our men were veterans, cool and determined, and fought magnificently. The rebel officers led their men in person to the several persistent assaults, continuing the battle far into the night, when they drew off, beaten and discomfited. Their loss was very severe, especially in general officers, among them Generals Claiborne and Adams, division commanders. Hood's loss on that day was afterward ascertained to be Thomas's report. Buried on the field, 1,750, left in hospital at Franklin, 3,800, and 702 prisoners captured and held. Aggregate, 6,252. General Schofield's loss, reported officially, was 189 killed, 1,033 wounded, and 1,104 prisoners, or missing. Aggregate, 2,326. The next day General Schofield crossed the Harbeth without trouble and fell back to the defenses of Nashville. Meanwhile, General Thomas had organized the employees of the quartermaster's department into a corps commanded by the chief quartermaster, General J. Z. Donelson, and placed them in the fortifications of Nashville under the general direction of Major General Z. B. Tower, now of the United States Engineers. He had also received the two veteran divisions of the 16th Corps under General A. J. Smith, long absent and long expected and he had drawn from Chattanooga and Decatur, Alabama, the divisions of Steedman and R. S. Granger. These, with General Schofield's army and about 10,000 good cavalry under General J. H. Wilson, constituted a strong army, capable not only of defending Nashville, but of beating Hood in the open field. Yet Thomas remained inside of Nashville, seemingly passive, until General Hood had closed upon him and had entrenched his position. General Thomas had furthermore held fast to the railroad leading from Nashville to Chattanooga, leaving strong guards at its principal points, as at Murfreesboro, Deckard, Stevenson, Bridgeport, Whiteside, and Chattanooga. At Murfreesboro, the division of Rousseau was reinforced and strengthened up to about 8,000 men. At that time the weather was cold and sleety, the ground was covered with ice and snow, and both parties for a time rested on the defensive. Those matters stood at Nashville while we were closing down on Savannah in the early part of December 1864, and the country, as well as General Grant, was alarmed at the seeming passive conduct of General Thomas, and General Grant at one time considered the situation so dangerous that he thought of going to Nashville in person, but General John A. Logan, happening to be at City Point, was sent out to supersede General Thomas. Luckily for the latter, he acted in time, gained a magnificent victory, and thus escaped so terrible a fate. On the 18th of December, at my camp by the side of the Plank Road, eight miles back of Savannah, I received General Hardee's letter declining to surrender, when nothing remained but to assault. The ground was difficult, and as all former assaults had proved so bloody, I concluded to make one more effort to completely surround Savannah on all sides, so as further to excite Hardee's fears, and, in case of success, to capture the whole of his army. We had already completely invested the place on the north, west, and south, but there remained to the enemy on the east the use of the old dyke or plank road leading into South Carolina, and I knew that Hardy would have a pontoon bridge across the river. On examining my maps, I thought that the division of John P. Hatch, belonging to General Foster's command, might be moved from its then position at Broad River by water down to Bluffton, from which it could reach this plank road, fortify it, and hold it, at some risk, of course, because Hardy could avail himself of his central position to fall on this detachment with his whole army. I did not want to make a mistake like Ball's Bluff at that period of the war, so taking one or two of my personal staff, I rode back to Grog's Bridge, leaving with Generals Howard and Slocum orders to make all possible preparation but not to attack during my two or three days' absence, and there I took a boat for Wausau Sound, whence Admiral Dahlgren conveyed me in his own boat, the Harvest Moon, to Hilton Head, 
where I represented the matter to General Foster, and he promptly agreed to give his personal attention to it. During the night of the 20th we started back, the wind blowing strong. Admiral Dahlgren ordered the pilot of the Harvest Moon to run into Tibby and to work his way through Wasaw Sound and the Ogeechee River by the Romney Marshes. We were caught by a low tide and stuck in the mud. After laboring some time, the Admiral ordered out his barge. In it we pulled through this intricate and shallow channel, and toward evening of December 21st, we discovered coming toward us a tug called the Red Legs, belonging to the quartermaster's department, with a staff officer on board, bearing letters from Colonel Dayton to myself and the Admiral, reporting that the city of Savannah had been found evacuated on the morning of December 21st, and was then in our possession. General Hardy had crossed the Savannah River by a pontoon bridge, carrying off his men and light artillery, blowing up his ironclads and navy yard, but leaving for us all the heavy guns, stores, cotton, railway cars, steamboats, and an immense amount of public and private property. Admiral Dahlgren concluded to go toward a vessel, the Sonoma, of his blockading fleet, which lay at anchor near Boileau, and I transferred to the Red Legs and hastened up the Ogeechee River to Grog's Bridge, whence I rode to my camp that same night. I there learned that early on the morning of December 21st the skirmishers had detected the absence of the enemy, and had occupied his lines simultaneously along their whole extent. But the left flank, Slocum, especially Gary's division of the 20th Corps, claimed to have been the first to reach the heart of the city. Generals Slocum and Howard moved their headquarters at once into the city, leaving the bulk of their troops in camps outside. On the morning of December 22nd, I followed with my own headquarters and rode down Bull Street to the Custom House, from the roof of which we had an extensive view over the city, the river, and the vast extent of marsh and rice fields on the South Carolina side. The navy yard and the wreck of the ironclad ram Savannah were still smoldering, but all else looked quiet enough. Turning back, we rode to the Pulaski Hotel, which I had known in years long gone, and found it kept by a Vermont man with a lame leg, who used to be a clerk in the St. Louis Hotel, New Orleans, and I inquired about the capacity of his hotel for headquarters. He was very anxious to have us for boarders, but I soon explained to him that we had a full mess equipment along, and that we were not in the habit of paying board, that one wing of the building would suffice for our use, while I would allow him to keep an hotel for the accommodation of officers and gentlemen in the remainder. I then dispatched an officer to look round for a livery stable that could accommodate our horses, and while waiting there, an English gentleman, Mr. Charles Green, came and said that he had a fine house completely furnished, for which he had no use, and offered it as headquarters. He explained, moreover, that General Howard had informed him the day before that I would want his house for headquarters. At first I felt strongly disinclined to make use of any private dwelling, lest complaints should arise of damage and loss of furniture, and so expressed myself to Mr. Green. But after writing about the city, and finding his house so spacious, so convenient, with large yard and stabling, I accepted his offer, and occupied that house during our stay in Savannah. He only reserved for himself the use of a couple of rooms above the dining-room, and we had all else, and a most excellent house it was in all respects. I was disappointed that Hardy had escaped with his army, but on the whole we had reason to be content with the substantial fruits of victory. The Savannah River was found to be badly obstructed by torpedoes and by log piers stretched across the channel below the city, which piers were filled with the cobblestones that formerly paved the streets. Admiral Dahlgren was extremely active and visited me repeatedly in the city, while his fleet still watched Charleston and all the avenues, for the blockade runners had infested the coast, which were notoriously owned and managed by Englishmen who used the island of New Providence, Nassau, as a sort of entrepot. One of these small blockade runners came into Savannah after we were in full possession, and the master did not discover his mistake till he came ashore to visit the custom house. Of course his vessel fell a prize to the navy. 
a heavy force was at once set to work to remove the torpedoes and obstructions in the main channel of the river, and from that time forth Savannah became the great depot of supply for the troops operating in that quarter. Meantime, on the 15th and 16th of December, were fought in front of Nashville the great battles in which General Thomas so nobly fulfilled his promise to ruin Hood, the details of which are fully given in his own official reports, long since published. Rumors of these great victories reached us at Savannah by piecemeal, but his official report came on the 24th of December with a letter from General Grant giving in general terms the events up to the 18th, and I wrote at once through my chief of staff, General Webster, to General Thomas, complimenting him in the highest terms. His brilliant victory at Nashville was necessary to mine at Savannah to make a complete whole, and this fact was perfectly comprehended by Mr. Lincoln, who recognized it fully in his personal letter of December 26th, herein before quoted at length, and which is also claimed at the time in my special field order number 6 of January 8, 1865, here given. Special Field Order Number 6 Headquarters, Military Division of the Mississippi, in the field, near Savannah, Georgia, January 8, 1864. The General Commanding announces to the troops composing the Military Division of the Mississippi that he has received from the President of the United States and from Lieutenant General Grant letters conveying their high sense and appreciation of the campaign just closed, resulting in the capture of Savannah and the defeat of Hood's army in Tennessee. In order that all may understand the importance of events, it is proper to revert to the situation of affairs in September last. We held Atlanta, a city of little value to us, but so important to the enemy that Mr. Davis, the head of the rebellious faction in the South, visited his army near Palmetto and commanded it to regain the place and also to ruin and destroy us by a series of measures which he thought would be effectual. That army, by a rapid march, gained our railroad near Big Shanty, and afterward about Dalton. We pursued it, but it moved so rapidly that we could not overtake it, and General Hood led his army successfully far over toward Mississippi in hope to decoy us out of Georgia. But we were not thus to be led away by him, and preferred to lead and control events ourselves. Generals Thomas and Schofield, commanding the departments to our rear, returned to their posts and prepared to decoy General Hood into their meshes, while we came on to complete the original journey. We quietly and deliberately destroyed Atlanta and all the railroads which the enemy had used to carry on war against us, occupied his state capital, and then captured his commercial capital, which had been so strongly fortified from the sea as to defy approach from that quarter. Almost at the moment of our victorious entry into Savannah came the welcome and expected news that our comrades in Tennessee had also fulfilled nobly and well their part, had decoyed General Hood to Nashville, and then turned on him, defeating his army thoroughly, capturing all his artillery, great numbers of prisoners, and were still pursuing the fragments down in Alabama. So complete success in military operations, extending over half a continent, is an achievement that entitles it to a place in the military history of the world. The armies serving in Georgia and Tennessee, as well as the local garrisons of Decatur, Bridgeport, Chattanooga, and Murfreesboro, are alike entitled to the common honors, and each regiment may inscribe in its colors, at pleasure, the word Savannah or Nashville. The general commanding embraces, in the same general success, the operations of the cavalry under General Stoneman, Burbage, and Gillum that penetrated into southwest Virginia and paralyzed the efforts of the enemy to disturb the peace and safety of East Tennessee. Instead of being put on the defensive, we have at all points assumed the bold offensive and have completely thwarted the designs of the enemies of our country. By order of Major General W.T. Sherman, L.M. Dayton, aide-de-camp. Here terminated the march to the sea, and I only add a few letters, selected out of many, to illustrate the general feeling of rejoicing throughout the country at the time. 
I only regarded the march from Atlanta to Savannah as a shift of base, as the transfer of a strong army, which had no opponent, and had finished its then work from the interior to a point on the sea coast, from which it could achieve other important results. I considered this march as a means to an end, and not as an essential act of war. Still, then as now, the march to the sea was generally regarded as something extraordinary, something anomalous, something out of the usual order of events, whereas, in fact, I simply moved from Atlanta to Savannah as one step in the direction of Richmond, a movement that had to be met and defeated, or the war was necessarily at an end. Were I to express my measure of the relative importance of the march to the sea and of that from Savannah northward, I would place the former at one and the latter at ten, or the maximum. I now close this long chapter by giving a tabular statement of the losses during the march and the number of prisoners captured. The property captured consisted of horses and mules by the thousands and of quantities of subsistence stores that aggregate very large, but may be measured with sufficient accuracy by assuming that 65,000 men obtained abundant food for about 40 days and 35,000 animals were fed for a like period, so as to reach Savannah in splendid flesh and condition. I also add a few of the more important letters that passed between Generals Grant, Halleck, and myself, which illustrate our opinions at that stage of the war. Statement of Casualties and Prisoners Captured by the Army in the Field, Campaign of Georgia Officers killed 10, men killed 93, officers wounded 24, men wounded 404. Officers missing, 1, men missing, 277, officers captured, 77, men captured, 1,261. Headquarters of the Army, Washington, December 16, 1864. Major General Sherman, via Hilton Head. General. Lieutenant General Grant informs me that in his last dispatch sent to you, he suggested the transfer of your infantry to Richmond. He now wishes me to say that you will retain your entire force, at least for the present, and with such assistance as may be given you by General Foster and Admiral Dahlgren, operate from such base as you may establish on the coast. General Foster will obey such instructions as may be given by you. Should you have captured Savannah, it is thought that by transferring the water batteries to the land side, that place may be made a good depot and base of operations on Augusta, Branchville, or Charleston. If Savannah should not be captured, or if captured and not deemed suitable for this purpose, perhaps Beaufort could serve as a depot. As the rebels have probably removed their most valuable property from Augusta, perhaps Branchville would be the most important point at which to strike in order to sever all connection between Virginia and the Southwestern Railroad. General Grant's wishes, however, are that this whole matter of your future actions should be entirely left to your discretion. We can send you from here a number of complete batteries of field artillery, with or without horses, as you may desire. Also, as soon as General Thomas can spare them all the fragments, convalescence, and furloughed men of your army. It is reported that Thomas defeated Hood yesterday near Nashville, but we have no particulars nor official reports, telegraphic communication being interrupted by a heavy storm. Our last advices from you was General Howard's note announcing his approach to Savannah. Yours truly, H. W. Halleck, Major General, Chief of Staff. Headquarters of the Army, Washington, December 18, 1864. Major General W. T. Sherman, Savannah, via Hilton Head. My dear General, Yours of the 13th by Major Anderson is just received. I congratulate you on your splendid success, and shall very soon expect to hear of the crowning work of your campaign, the capture of Savannah. Your march will stand out prominently as the great one of this great war. When Savannah falls, then for another wide swath through the center of the Confederacy. But I will not anticipate. General Grant is expected here this morning, and will probably write you his own views. 
I do not learn from your letter or from Major Anderson that you are in want of anything which we have not provided at Hilton Head. Thinking it probable that you might want more field artillery, I had prepared several batteries, but the great difficulty of foraging horses on the sea coast will prevent our sending any unless you actually need them. The hay crop this year is short, and the quartermaster's department has great difficulty in procuring a supply for our animals. General Thomas has defeated Hood near Nashville, and it is hoped that he will completely crush his army. Breckenridge, at last accounts, was trying to form a junction near Murfreesboro, but as Thomas is between them, Breckenridge must either retreat or be defeated. General Rosecrans made very bad work of it in Missouri, allowing Price with a small force to overrun the state and destroy millions of property. Orders have been issued for all officers and detachments having three months or more to serve to rejoin your army via Savannah. Those having less than three months to serve will be retained by General Thomas. Should you capture Charleston, I hope that by some accident the place may be destroyed, and if a little salt should be sown upon its site, it may prevent the growth of future crops of nullification and succession. Yours truly, H. W. Halleck, Major General, Chief of Staff. Headquarters of the Army, Washington, December 18, 1864, to Major General W. T. Sherman, Commanding, Military Division of the Mississippi. My dear General, I have just received and read, I need not tell you with how much gratification, your letter to General Halleck. I congratulate you and the brave officers and men under your command on the successful termination of your most brilliant campaign. I never had a doubt of the result. When apprehensions for your safety were expressed by the President, I assured him, with the army you had and you in command of it, there was no danger but you would strike bottom on salt water some place, that I would not feel the same security, in fact would not have entrusted the expedition to any other living commander. It has been very hard work to get Thomas to attack Hood. I gave him the most peremptory order and had started to go there myself before he got off. He has done magnificently, however, since he started. Up to last night, 5,000 prisoners and 49 pieces of captured artillery, besides many wagons and innumerable small arms, had been received in Nashville. This is exclusive of the enemy's loss of Franklin, which amounted to 13 general officers killed, wounded, and captured. The enemy probably lost 5,000 men at Franklin and 10,000 in the last three days' operations. Breckenridge is said to be making for Murfreesboro. I think he is in a most excellent place. Stoneman has already wiped out John Morgan's old command, and five days ago entered Bristol. I did think the best thing to do was to bring the greater part of your army here and wipe out Lee. The turn affairs now seem to be taking has shaken me in that opinion. I doubt whether you may not accomplish more toward that result where you are than if brought here, especially as I am informed since my arrival in the city that it would take about two months to get you here with all the other calls there are for ocean transportation. I want to get your views about what ought to be done and what can be done. If you capture the garrison of Savannah, it certainly will compel Lee to detach from Richmond or give us nearly the whole South. My own opinion is that Lee is averse to going out of Virginia, and if the cause of the South is lost, he wants Richmond to be the last place surrendered. If he has such views, it may be well to indulge him until we get everything else in our hands. Congratulating you and the Army again upon the splendid results of your campaign, the like of which is not read of in past history, I subscribe myself more than ever if possible, your friend, U.S. Grant, Lieutenant General. Headquarters of the Army, City Point, Virginia, December 26, 1864, Major General W.T. Sherman, Savannah, Georgia. General, your very interesting letter of the 22nd instant brought by Major Gray of General Foster's staff is fast at hand. As the Major starts back at once, I can do no more at present than simply acknowledge its receipt. The capture of Savannah, with all its immense stores, must tell upon the people of the South. All well here, yours truly, 
U.S. Grant, Lieutenant General. Headquarters, Military Division of the Mississippi, Savannah, Georgia, December 24, 1864. Lieutenant General U.S. Grant, City Point, Virginia. General, your letter of December 18th is just received. I feel very much gratified at receiving the handsome commendation you pay my army. I will, in general orders, convey to the officers and men the substance of your note. I am also pleased that you have modified your former orders, for I feared that the transportation by sea would very much disturb the unity and morale of my army, now so perfect. The occupation of Savannah, which I have heretofore reported, completes the first part of our game and fulfills a greater part of your instructions, and we are now engaged in dismantling the rebel forts which bear upon the sea channels and transferring the heavy ordnance and ammunition to Fort Pulaski and Hilton Head, where they can be more easily guarded than if left in the city." The rebel inner lines are well adapted to our purposes and with slight modifications can be held by a comparatively small force, and in about ten days I expect to be ready to sally forth again. I feel no doubt whatever as to our future plans. I have thought them over so long and well that they appear as clear as daylight. I left Augusta untouched on purpose because the enemy will be in doubt as to my objective point after we cross the Savannah River, whether it be Augusta or Charleston, and will naturally divide his forces. I will then move either on Branchville or Columbia by any curved line that gives us the best supplies, breaking up in our course as much railroad as possible, then ignoring Charleston and Augusta both, I will occupy Columbia and Camden pausing there long enough to observe the effect. I would then strike for the Charleston and Wilmington Railroad somewhere between the Santee and Cape Fear rivers, and, if possible, communicate with the fleet under Admiral Dahlgren, whom I find a most agreeable gentleman, accommodating himself to our wishes and plans. Then I would favor an attack on Wilmington in the belief that Porter and Butler will fail in their present undertaking. Charleston is now a mere desolated wreck, and is hardly worth the time it would take to starve it out. Still, I am aware that historically and politically much importance is attached to the place, and it may be that, apart from its military importance, both you and the administration may prefer I should give it more attention, and it would be well for you to give me some general idea on that subject, for otherwise I would treat it as I have expressed as a point of little importance, after all its railroads leading into the interior have been destroyed or occupied by us. But on the hypothesis of ignoring Charleston and taking Wilmington, I would then favor a movement direct on Raleigh. The game is then up with Lee unless he comes out of Richmond, avoids you, and fights me, in which case I should reckon on your being on his heels. Now that Hood is used up by Thomas, I feel disposed to bring the matter to an issue as quick as possible. I feel confident that I can break up the whole railroad system of South Carolina and North Carolina, and beyond the Roanoke, either at Raleigh or Weldon, by the time spring fairly opens, and if you feel confident that you can whip Lee outside of his entrenchments, I feel equally confident that I can handle him in the open country." One reason why I would ignore Charleston is this, that I believe Hardy will reduce the garrison to a small force with plenty of provisions. I know that the neck back of Charleston can be made impregnable to assault, and we will hardly have time for siege operations. I will have to leave in Savannah a garrison, and if Thomas can spare them, I would like to have all detachments, convalescents, etc., belonging to these four corps, sent forward at once. I do not want to cripple Thomas, because I regard his operations as all-important, and I have ordered him to pursue Hood down into Alabama, trusting to the country for supplies. I reviewed one of my corps today, and shall continue to review the whole army. I do not like to boast, but believe this army has a confidence in itself that makes it almost invincible. I wish you could run down and see us. It would have a good effect." and show to both armies that they are acting on a common plan. The weather is now cool and pleasant, and the general health very good. 
Your true friend, W. T. Sherman, Major General. Headquarters, Military Division of the Mississippi in the Field, Savannah, Georgia, December 24, 1864. Major General H. W. Halleck, Chief of Staff, Washington, D.C. General, I had the pleasure of receiving your two letters of the 16th and 18th instant today, and feel more than usually flattered by the high encomiums you have passed on our recent campaign, which is now complete by the occupation of Savannah. I am also very glad that General Grant has changed his mind about embarking my troops for James River, leaving me free to make the broad swath you describe through South and North Carolina, and still more gratified at the news from Thomas in Tennessee, because it fulfills my plans, which contemplated his being able to dispose of Hood in case he ventured north of the Tennessee River. So I think on the whole I can chuckle over Jeff Davis's disappointment in not turning my Atlanta campaign into a Moscow disaster. I have just finished a long letter to General Grant and have explained to him that we are engaged in shifting our base from the Ogeechee to the Savannah River, dismantling all the forts made by the enemy to bear upon the saltwater channels, transferring the heavy ordnance, etc., to Fort Pulaski and Hilton Head, and in remodeling the enemy's interior lines to suit our future plans and purposes. I have also laid down the program for a campaign which I can make this winter, and which will put me in the spring on the Roanoke, in direct communication with General Grant on James River. In general terms, my plan is to turn over to General Foster, the city of Savannah, to sally forth with my army resupplied, cross the Savannah, feign on Charleston and Augusta, but strike between, breaking en route the Charleston and Augusta Railroad, also a large part of that from Branchville and Camden toward North Carolina, and then rapidly to move for some point of the railroad from Charleston to Wilmington between the Santee and Cape Fear rivers. Then communicating with the fleet in the neighborhood of Georgetown, I would turn upon Wilmington or Charleston, according to the importance of either. I rather prefer Wilmington as a live place over Charleston, which is dead and unimportant, when its railroad communications are broken. I take it for granted that the present movement on Wilmington will fail. If I should determine to take Charleston, I would turn across the country, which I have hunted over many a time, from Santee to Mount Pleasant, throwing one wing on the peninsula between the Ashley and Cooper. After accomplishing one or other of these ends, I would make a bee-line for Raleigh or Weldon, when Lee would be forced to come out of Richmond or acknowledge himself beaten. He would, I think, by the use of the Danville Railroad, throw himself rapidly between me and Grant, leaving Richmond in the hands of the latter. This would not alarm me, for I have an army which I think can maneuver, and I would force him to attack me at a disadvantage, always under the supposition that Grant would be on his heels, and if worse comes to the worst, I can fight my way down to Albemarle Sound or Newborn. I think the time has come now when we should attempt the boldest moves, and my experience is that they are easier of execution than more timid ones because the enemy is disconcerted by them, as, for instance, my recent campaign. I also doubt the wisdom of concentration beyond a certain extent, for the roads of this country limit the amount of men that can be brought to bear in any one battle, and I do not believe that any one general can handle more than 60,000 men in battle. I think our campaign of the last month, as well as every step I take from this point northward, is as much a direct attack upon Lee's army as though we were operating within the sound of his artillery. I am very anxious that Thomas should follow up his success to the very utmost point. My orders to him before I left Kingston were, after beating Hood, to follow him as far as Columbus, Mississippi, or Selma, Alabama, both of which lie in districts of country which are rich in corn and meat. I attach more importance to these deep incisions into the enemy's country, because this war differs from European wars in this particular we are not only fighting hostile armies, but a hostile people, and must make old and young, rich and poor, feel the hard hand of war, as well as their organized armies. 
I know that this recent movement of mine through Georgia has had a wonderful effect in this respect. Thousands who had been deceived by their lying newspapers to believe that we were being whipped all the time now realize the truth and have no appetite for a repetition of the same experience. To be sure, Jeff Davis has his people under pretty good discipline, but I think faith in him is much shaken in Georgia, and before we have done with her, South Carolina will not be quite so tempestuous. I will bear in mind your hint as to Charleston, and do not think that salt will be necessary. When I move, the 15th Corps will be on the right of the right wing, and their position will naturally bring them into Charleston first and if you have watched the history of that corps you will have remarked that they generally do their work pretty well the truth is the whole army is burning with an insatiable desire to wreak vengeance upon south carolina i almost tremble at her fate but feel that she deserves all that seems in store for her many and many a person in georgia asked me why we did not go to south carolina and when i answered that we were en route for that state the invariable reply was, Well, if you will make those people feel the utmost severities of war, we will pardon you for your desolation of Georgia. I look upon Columbia as quite as bad as Charleston, and I doubt if we shall spare the public buildings there as we did at Milledgeville. I have been so busy lately that I have not yet made my official report, and I think I had better wait until I get my subordinate reports before attempting it as I am anxious to explain clearly not only the reasons for every step, but the amount of execution done, and this I cannot do until I get the subordinate reports, for we march the whole distance in four or more columns, and of course I could only be present with one, and generally that one engaged in destroying railroads. This work of destruction was performed better than usual, because I had an engineer regiment provided with claws to twist the bars after being heated. Such bars can never be used again, and the only way in which a railroad line can be reconstructed across Georgia is to make a new road from Fairburn Station, 24 miles southwest of Atlanta, to Madison, a distance of 100 miles, and before that can be done, I propose to be on the road from Augusta to Charleston, which is a continuation of the same. I felt somewhat disappointed at Hardy's escape, but really am not to blame. I moved as quickly as possible to close up the Union Causeway, but intervening obstacles were such that before I could get troops on the road, Hardy had slipped out. Still, I know that the men that were in Savannah will be lost, in a measure, to Jeff Davis, for the Georgia troops under G.W. Smith declared they would not fight in South Carolina, and they have gone north en route for Augusta, and I have reason to believe the North Carolina troops have gone to Wilmington. In other words, they are scattered. I have reason to believe that Beauregard was present in Savannah at the time of its evacuation, and think that he and Hardy are now in Charleston, making preparations for what they suppose will be my next step. Please say to the President that I have received his kind message through Colonel Markland, and feel thankful for his high favor. If I disappoint him in the future, it shall not be from want of zeal or love to the cause. From you I expect a full and frank criticism of my plans for the future, which may enable me to correct errors before it is too late. I do not wish to be rash, but want to give my rebel friends no chance to accuse us of want of enterprise or courage. Assuring you of my high personal respect, I remain, as ever, your friend, W. T. Sherman, Major General. General Order Number Three, War Department, Adjutant General's Office, Washington, January 14, 1865. The following resolution of the Senate and House of Representatives is published to the Army. Public Resolution Number Four. Joint resolution tendering the thanks of the people and of Congress to Major General William T. Sherman and the officers and soldiers of his command for their gallant conduct in their late brilliant movement through Georgia. 
Be it resolved by the Senate and the House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled that the thanks of the people and of the Congress of the United States are due and are hereby tendered to Major General William T. Sherman and through him to the officers and men under his command for their gallantry and good conduct in their late campaign from Chattanooga to Atlanta and the triumphal march thence through Georgia to Savannah terminating in the capture and occupation of that city, and that the President cause a copy of this joint resolution to be engrossed and forwarded to Major General Sherman. Approved January 10, 1865, by order of the Secretary of War, W. A. Nichols, Assistant Adjutant General. We all remained strung along this railroad till the 9th of February, the 17th Corps on the right, then the 15th, 20th, and Cavalry at Blackville. General Slocum reached Blackville that day with Gary's division of the 20th Corps and reported the 14th Corps, General Jeff C. Davis's, to be following by way of Barnwell. On the 10th, I rode up to Blackville, where I conferred with Generals Slocum and Kilpatrick, became satisfied that the whole army would be ready within a day, and accordingly made orders for the next movement north to Columbia, the right wing to strike Orangeburg en route. Kilpatrick was ordered to demonstrate strongly toward Aiken to keep up the delusion that we might turn to Augusta, but he was notified that Columbia was the next objective, and that he should cover the left flank against Wheeler, who hung around it. I wanted to reach Columbia before any part of Hood's army could possibly get there. Some of them were reported as having reached Augusta under the command of General Dick Taylor. Having sufficiently damaged the railroad and effected the junction of the entire army, the general march was resumed on the 11th, each corps crossing the South Edisto by separate bridges, with orders to pause on the road leading from Orangeburg to Augusta till it was certain that the 17th Corps had got possession of Orangeburg. This place was simply important, as its occupation would sever the communications between Charleston and Columbia. All the heads of column reached this road, known as the Edgefield Road, during the 12th, and the 17th Corps turned to the right against Orangeburg. When I reached the head of column opposite Orangeburg, I found Giles A. Smith's division halted, with a battery unlimbered, exchanging shots with the party on the opposite side of the Edisto. He reported that the bridge was gone and that the river was deep and impassable. I then directed General Blair to send a strong division below the town, some four or five miles, to effect a crossing there. He laid his pontoon bridge, but the bottom on the other side was overflowed, and the men had to wade through it in places as deep as their waists. I was with this division at the time, on foot, trying to pick my way across the overflowed bottom, but as soon as the head of column reached the sand hills, I knew that the enemy would not long remain in Orangeburg, and accordingly returned to my horse on the west bank, and rode rapidly up to where I had left Giles A. Smith. I found him in possession of the broken bridge, abreast of the town, which he was repairing, and I was among the first to cross over and enter the town. By and before the time either forces or Giles A. Smith's skirmishers entered the place, several stores were on fire, and I am sure that some of the townspeople told me that a Jew merchant had set fire to his own cotton and store, and from this the fire had spread. This, however, was soon put out, and the 17th Corps, General Blair, occupied the place during the night. I remember to have visited a large hospital on the hill near the railroad depot, which was occupied by the orphan children who had been removed from the asylum in Charleston. We gave them protection and, I think, some provisions. The railroad and depot were destroyed by order, and no doubt a good deal of cotton was burned, for we all regarded cotton as hostile property, a thing to be destroyed. General Blair was ordered to break up this railroad forward to the point where it crossed the Santee, and then to turn for Columbia. On the morning of the 13th, I again joined the 15th Corps, which crossed the North Edisto by Snilling's Bridge and moved straight for Columbia around the head of Kaka Swamp. 
Orders were sent to all the columns to turn for Columbia, where it was supposed the enemy had concentrated all the men they could from Charleston, Augusta, and even from Virginia. That night I was with the 15th Corps, 21 miles from Columbia, where my aide, Colonel Audenrieg, picked up a rebel officer on the road, who, supposing him to be of the same service with himself, answered all his questions frankly, and revealed the truth that there was nothing in Columbia except Hampton's cavalry. The fact was that General Hardy, in Charleston, took it for granted that we were after Charleston. The rebel troops in Augusta supposed they were our objective, so they abandoned poor Columbia to the care of Hampton's cavalry, which was confused by the rumors that poured in on it, so that both Beauregard and Wade Hampton, who were in Columbia, seemed to have lost their heads. On the 14th, the head of the 15th Corps, Charles R. Wood's division, approached the little congaree, a broad, deep stream, tributary to the main congaree six or eight miles below Columbia. On the opposite side of this stream was a newly constructed fort, and on our side a wide extent of old cotton fields which had been overflowed and was covered with a deep slime. General Woods had deployed his leading brigade, which was skirmishing forward, but he reported that the bridge was gone and that a considerable force of the enemy was on the other side. I directed General Howard, or Logan, to send a brigade by a circuit to the left to see if this stream could not be crossed higher up, but at the same time knew that General Slocum's route would bring him to Columbia behind this stream, and that his approach would uncover it. Therefore there was no need of exposing much life. The brigade, however, found means to cross the Little Congaree, and thus uncovered the passage by the main road, so that General Wood's skirmishers at once passed over, and a party was set to work to repair the bridge, which occupied less than an hour, when I passed over with my whole staff. I found the new fort unfinished and unoccupied, but from its parapet could see over some old fields bounded to the north and west by hills skirted with timber. There was a plantation to our left, about half a mile, and on the edge of the timber was drawn up a force of rebel cavalry of about a regiment, which advanced and charged upon some of our foragers who were plundering the plantation. My aide, Colonel Audenreed, who had ridden forward, came back somewhat hurt and bruised, for observing this charge of cavalry he had turned for us and his horse fell with him in attempting to leap a ditch. General Wood's skirmish line met this charge of cavalry and drove it back into the woods and beyond. We remained on that ground during the night of the 15th, and I camped on the nearest dry ground behind the little congaree, where on the next morning were made the written orders for the government of the troops while occupying Columbia. These are dated February 16, 1865, in these words. General Howard will cross the Saluda and Broad Rivers as near their mouths as possible, occupy Columbia, destroy the public buildings, railroad property, manufacturing, and machine shops, but will spare libraries, asylums, and private dwellings. He will then move to Winsboro, destroying en route entirely that section of the railroad. He will also cause all bridge, trestles, water tanks, and depots on the railroad back to the watery to be burned, switches broken, and other destruction as he can find time to accomplish, consistent with proper celerity. These instructions were embraced in General Order No. 26, which prescribed the routes of march for the several columns as far as Fayetteville, North Carolina, and is conclusive that I then regarded Columbia as simply one point on our general route of march, and not as an important conquest. During the 16th of February, the 15th Corps reached the point opposite Columbia and pushed on for the Saluda factory three miles above, crossed that stream, and the head of column reached Broad River just in time to find its bridge in flames, Butler's cavalry having just passed over into Columbia. The head of Slocum's column also reached the point opposite Columbia the same morning, but the bulk of his army was back at Lexington. I reached this place early in the morning of the 16th, met General Slocum there, and explained to him the purport of General Order No. 26, which contemplated the passage of his army across Broad River at Alston, 
fifteen miles above Columbia. Riding down to the river bank, I saw the wreck of the large bridge, which had been burned by the enemy, with its many stone piers still standing, but the superstructure gone. Across the Congaree River lay the city of Columbia in plain, easy view. I could see the unfinished state house, a handsome granite structure, and the ruins of the railroad depot, which were still smoldering. Occasionally a few citizens or cavalry could be seen running across the streets, and quite a number of negroes were seemingly busy in carrying off bags of grain or meal, which were piled up near the burned depot. Captain de Grace had a section of his twenty-pound parrot guns unlimbered, firing into the town. I asked him what he was firing for. He said he could see some rebel cavalry occasionally at the intersections of the streets, and he had an idea that there was a large force of infantry concealed on the opposite bank, lying low, in case we should attempt to cross over directly into the town. I instructed him not to fire any more into the town, but consented to his bursting a few shells near the depot to scare away the negroes who were appropriating the bags of corn and meal which we wanted, also to fire three shots at the unoccupied state house. I stood by and saw these fired, and then all firing ceased. Although this matter of firing into Columbia has been the subject of much abuse and investigation, I have yet to hear of any single person having been killed in Columbia by our cannon. On the other hand, the night before, when Woods's division was in camp in the open fields at Little Congaree, it was shelled all night by a rebel battery from the other side of the river. This provoked me much at the time, for it was wanton mischief, as Generals Beauregard and Hampton must have been convinced that they could not prevent our entrance into Columbia. I have always contended that I would have been justified in retaliating for this unnecessary act of war, but did not, though I always characterized it as it deserved. The night of the 16th I camped near an old prison bivouac opposite Columbia, known to our prisoners of war as Camp Salgram, where remained the mud hovels and holes in the ground which our prisoners had made to shelter themselves from the winter's cold and the summer's heat. The 15th Corps was then ahead, reaching to Broad River, about four miles above Columbia. The 17th Corps was behind on the river bank opposite Columbia, and the left wing and cavalry had turned north toward Alston. The next morning, viz. February 17th, I rode to the head of General Howard's column and found that during the night he had ferried Stone's brigade of Wood's division of the 15th Corps across by rafts made of the pontoons, and the brigade was then deployed on the opposite bank to cover the construction of a pontoon bridge nearly finished. I sat with General Howard on a log watching the men lay this bridge, and about 9 or 10 a.m. a messenger came from Colonel Stone on the other side, saying that the mayor of Columbia had come out of the city to surrender the place and asked for orders. I simply remarked to General Howard that he had his orders to let Colonel Stone go on into the city and that we would follow as soon as the bridge was ready. By this same messenger I received a note in pencil from the Lady Superioress of a convent or school in Columbia, in which she claimed to have been a teacher in a convent in Brown County, Ohio, at the time my daughter Minnie was a pupil there, and therefore asking special protection. My recollection is that I gave the note to my brother-in-law, Colonel Ewing, then Inspector General on my staff, with instructions to see this lady and assure her that we contemplated no destruction of any private property in Columbia at all. As soon as the bridge was done, I led my horse over it, followed by my whole staff. General Howard accompanied me with his, and General Logan was next in order, followed by General C. R. Woods and the whole of the 15th Corps. Ascending the hill, we soon emerged into a broad road leading into Columbia, between old fields of corn and cotton, and entering the city, we found seemingly all its population, white and black, in the streets. A high and boisterous wind was prevailing from the north, and flakes of cotton were flying about in the air and lodging in the limbs of the trees, reminding us of a northern snowstorm. 
Near the market square we found Stone's brigade halted, with arms stacked and a large detail of his men, along with some citizens, engaged with an old fire engine, trying to put out the fire in a long pile of burning cotton bales, which I was told had been fired by the rebel cavalry on withdrawing from the city that morning. I know that to avoid this row of burning cotton bales I had to ride my horse on the sidewalk, in the market square had collected a large crowd of whites and blacks, among whom was the mayor of the city, Dr. Goodwin, quite a respectable old gentleman, who was extremely anxious to protect the interests of the citizens. He was on foot and I on horseback, and it is probable I told him then not to be uneasy, that we did not intend to stay long, and had no purpose to injure the private citizens or private property. About this time I noticed several men trying to get through the crowd to speak with me, and called to some black people to make room for them. When they reached me, they explained that they were officers of our army, who had been prisoners, had escaped from the rebel prison and guard, and were of course overjoyed to find themselves safe with us. I told them that as soon as things settled down, they should report to General Howard, who would provide for their safety, and enable them to travel with us. One of them handed me a paper, asking me to read it at my leisure. I put it in my breast pocket, and rode on. General Howard was still with me, and riding down the street, which led to the right to the Charleston Depot, we found it and a large storehouse burned to the ground, but there were, on the platform and ground nearby, piles of cotton bags filled with corn and cornmeal partially burned. A detachment of Stone's brigade was guarding this and separating the good from the bad. We rode along the railroad track some three or four hundred yards to a large foundry, when some men rode up and said the rebel cavalry were close by, and he warned us that we might get shot. We accordingly turned back to the market square, and en route noticed that several of the men were evidently in liquor, when I called General Howard's attention to it. He left me and rode toward General Woods's head of column, which was defiling through the town. On reaching the market square, I again met Dr. Goodwin and inquired where he proposed to quarter me, and he said that he had selected the house of Blanton Duncan, Esquire, a citizen of Louisville, Kentucky, then a resident there, who had the contract for manufacturing the Confederate money, and had fled with Hampton's cavalry. We all rode some six or eight squares back from the new state house, and found a very good modern house, completely furnished with stabling and a large yard, took it as our headquarters, and occupied it during our stay. I considered General Howard as in command of the place, and referred the many applicants for guards and protection to him. Before our headquarters wagons had got up, I strolled through the streets of Columbia, found sentinels posted at the principal intersections, and generally good order prevailing, but did not again return to the main street, because it was filled with a crowd of citizens watching the soldiers marching by. During the afternoon of that day, February 17th, the whole of the 15th Corps passed through the town and out on the Camden and Winsboro's roads, the 17th Corps did not enter the city at all, but crossed directly over to the Winsboro Road from the pontoon bridge at Broad River, which was about four miles above the city. After we had got, as it were, settled in Blanton Duncan's house, say about 2 p.m., I overhauled my pocket, according to custom, to read more carefully the various notes and memoranda received during the day, and found the paper which had been given me as described by one of our escaped prisoners. It proved to be the song of Sherman's March to the Sea, which had been composed by Adjutant S. H. M. Byers of the 5th Iowa Infantry when a prisoner in the asylum at Columbia, which had been beautifully written off by a fellow prisoner and handed to me in person. This appeared to me so good that I at once sent for Byers, attached him to my staff, provided him with horse and equipment, and took him as far as Fayetteville, North Carolina, whence he was sent to Washington as bearer of dispatches. He is now United States Consul at Zurich, Switzerland, where I have since been his guest. I insert the song here for convenient reference and preservation. 
Byer said that there was an excellent glee club among the prisoners in Columbia who used to sing it well, with an audience often of rebel ladies. Sherman's March to the Sea, composed by Adjutant Byers, 5th Iowa Cavalry, arranged and sung by the prisoners in Columbia Prison. 1. Our campfire shone bright on the mountain that frowned on the river below, as we stood by our guns in the morning and eagerly watched for the foe. When a rider came out of the darkness that hung over mountain and tree, and shouted, Boys up and be ready, for Sherman will march to the sea. Chorus. Then sang we a song of our chieftain that echoed over river and lee, and the stars of our banner shone brighter when Sherman marched down to the sea. 2. Then cheer upon cheer for bold Sherman went up from each valley and glen, and the bugles re-echoed the music that came from the lips of the men. For we knew that the stars in our banner more bright in their splendor would be, and that blessings from Northland world greet us when Sherman marched down to the sea. Then sang we a song, etc. 3. Then forward, boys, forward to battle, we marched on our wearisome way. We stormed the wild hills of Resarkar. God bless those who fell on that day. Then Kennesaw frowned in its glory, frowned down on the flag of the free. But the east and the west bore our standard, and Sherman marched on to the sea. Then sang we a song, etc. 4. Still onward we pressed, till our banners swept out from Atlanta's grim walls, and the blood of the patriot dampened the soil where the traitor flag falls. But we paused not to weep for the fallen, who slept by each river and tree, yet we twined them a wreath of the laurel, as Sherman marched down to the sea, then sang we a song, etc. 5. O oh, proud was our army that morning that stood where the pine darkly towers, when Sherman said, Boys, you are weary, but today fair Savannah is ours. Then sang we the song of our chieftain that echoed over river and lee, and the stars in our banner shone brighter when Sherman camped down by the sea. Toward evening of February 17th, the mayor, Dr. Goodwin, came to my quarters at Duncan's house and remarked that there was a lady in Columbia who professed to be a special friend of mine. On his giving her name, I could not recall it, but inquired as to her maiden or family name. He answered, Poyas. It so happened that when I was a lieutenant at Fort Moultrie in 1842-46, I used very often to visit a family of that name on the east branch of Cooper River, about 40 miles from Fort Moultrie, and to hunt with a son, Mr. James Poyas, an elegant young fellow and a fine sportsman. His father, mother, and several sisters composed the family and were extremely hospitable. One of the ladies was very fond of painting and watercolors, which was one of my weaknesses, and on one occasion I had presented her with a volume treating of watercolors. Of course, I was glad to renew the acquaintance, and proposed to Dr. Goodwin that we should walk to her house and visit this lady, which we did. The house stood beyond the Charlotte Depot, in a large lot, was of frame, with a high porch, which was reached by a set of steps outside. Entering this yard, I noticed ducks and chickens and a general air of peace and comfort that was really pleasant to behold at that time of universal desolation. The lady in question met us at the head of the steps and invited us into a parlor which was perfectly neat and well furnished. After inquiring about her father, mother, sisters, and especially her brother James, my special friend, I could not help saying that I was pleased to notice that our men had not handled her house and premises as roughly as was their wont. I owe it to you, General, she answered. Not at all. I did not know you were here till a few minutes ago. She reiterated that she was indebted to me for the perfect safety of her house and property, and added, You remember when you were at our house on Cooper River in 1845, you gave me a book, and she handed me the book in question on the flyleaf of which was written, To Miss Poyas, with the compliments of W. T. Sherman, 1st Lieutenant, 3rd Artillery. She then explained that as our army approached Columbia, 
There was a doubt in her mind whether the terrible Sherman who was devastating the land were W.T. Sherman or T.W. Sherman, both known to be generals in the Northern Army. But on the supposition that he was her old acquaintance, when Wade Hampton's cavalry drew out of the city, calling out that the Yankees were coming, she armed herself with this book and awaited the crisis. Soon the shouts about the market house announced that the Yankees had come. Very soon men were seen running up and down the streets. A parcel of them poured over the fence, began to chase the chickens and ducks, and to enter her house. She observed one large man with full beard who exercised some authority, and to him she appealed in the name of his general. "'What do you know of Uncle Billy?' Why, she said, when he was a young man, he used to be our friend in Charleston, and here is a book he gave me. The officer, or soldier, took the book, looked at the inscription, and, turning to his fellows, said, Boys, that's so. That's Uncle Billy's writing, for I have seen it often before. He at once commanded the party to stop pillaging, and left a man in charge of the house to protect her until the regular provost guard should be established. I then asked her if the regular guard or sentinel had been as good to her. She assured me that he was a very nice young man, that he had been telling her all about his family in Iowa, and that at that very instant of time he was in another room minding her baby. Now this lady had good sense and tact, and had thus turned aside a party who in five minutes more would have rifled her premises of all that was good to eat or wear. I made her a long social visit, and before leaving Columbia, gave her a half tierce of rice and about one hundred pounds of ham from our own mess stores. In like manner, that same evening, I found in Mrs. Simons another acquaintance, the wife of the brother of Honorable James Simons of Charleston, who had been Miss Ragg. When Columbia was on fire that night and her house in danger, I had her family and effects carried to my own headquarters, gave them my own room and bed, and on leaving Columbia the next day, supplied her with a half-barrel of hams and a half-tierce of rice. I mention these specific facts to show that, personally, I had no malice or desire to destroy that city or its inhabitants, as is generally believed at the South. Having walked over much of the suburbs of Columbia in the afternoon, and being tired, I lay down on a bed in Blanton Duncan's house to rest. Soon after dark I became conscious that a bright light was shining on the walls, and calling some one of my staff, Major Nichols, I think, to inquire the cause, he said there seemed to be a house on fire down about the market house. The same high wind still prevailed, and fearing the consequences, I bade him go in person to see if the provost guard were doing its duty. He soon returned and reported that the block of buildings directly opposite the burning cotton of that morning was on fire, and that it was spreading. But he had found General Woods on the ground, with plenty of men trying to put the fire out, or at least to prevent its extension. The fire continued to increase, and the whole heavens became lurid. I dispatched messenger after messenger to Generals Howard, Logan, and Woods, and received from them repeated assurance that all was being done that could be done, but that the high wind was spreading the flames beyond all control. These general officers were on the ground all night, and Hazen's division had been brought into the city to assist Woods' division already there. About eleven o'clock at night I went downtown myself, Colonel Dayton with me. We walked to Mr. Simons's house, from which I could see the flames rising high in the air, and could hear the roaring of the fire. I advised the ladies to move to my headquarters, had our own headquarters wagons hitched up, and their effects carried there as a place of greater safety. The whole air was full of sparks and of flying masses of cotton, shingles, etc., some of which were carried four or five blocks and started new fires. The men seemed generally under good control and certainly labored hard to girdle the fire to prevent it spreading. But so long as the high wind prevailed, it was simply beyond human possibility. Fortunately, about three or four a.m., the wind moderated, and gradually the fire was got under control— 
but it had burned out the very heart of the city, embracing several churches, the old state house, and the school or asylum of that very sister of charity who had appealed for my personal protection. Nickerson's hotel, in which several of my staff were quartered, was burned down, but the houses occupied by myself, Generals Howard and Logan, were not burned at all. Many of the people thought that this fire was deliberately planned and executed. This is not true. It was accidental, and in my judgment began with the cotton which General Hampton's men had set fire to on leaving the city, whether by his orders or not is not material, which fire was partially subdued early in the day by our men, but when night came the high wind fanned it again into full blaze, carried it against the frame houses which caught like tinder and soon spread beyond our control. This whole subject has been thoroughly and judicially investigated in some cotton cases by the Mixed Commission on American and British Claims under the Treaty of Washington, which commission failed to award a verdict in favor of the English claimants and thereby settled the fact that the destruction of property in Columbia during that night did not result from the acts of the general government of the United States, that is to say, from my army. In my official report of this conflagration, I distinctly charged it to General Wade Hampton, and confess I did so pointedly to shake the faith of his people in him, for he was, in my opinion, boastful, and professed to be the special champion of South Carolina. The morning sun of February 18th rose bright and clear over a ruined city. About half of it was in ashes and in smoldering heaps. Many of the people were houseless and gathered in groups in the suburbs or in the open parks and spaces around their scanty piles of furniture. General Howard, in concert with the mayor, did all that was possible to provide other houses for them, and by my authority he turned over to the Sisters of Charity, the Methodist College, and to the mayor five hundred beef cattle to help feed the people. I also gave the mayor, Dr. Goodwin, one hundred muskets with which to arm a guard to maintain order after we should leave the neighborhood. During the 18th and 19th we remained in Columbia. General Howard's troops engaged in tearing up and destroying the railroad back toward the Wateree, while a strong detail under the immediate supervision of Colonel O. M. Poe, United States Engineers, destroyed the state arsenal, which was found to be well supplied with shot, shell, and ammunition. These were hauled in wagons to the Saluda River under the supervision of Colonel Baylor, Chief of Ordnance, and emptied into deep water, causing a very serious accident by the bursting of a percussion shell as it struck another on the margin of the water. The flame followed back a train of powder which had sifted out, reached the wagons, still partially loaded, and exploded them, killing sixteen men and destroying several wagons and teams of mules. We also destroyed several valuable foundries and the factory of Confederate money. The dyes had been carried away, but about sixty hand-presses remained. There was also found an immense quantity of money in various stages of manufacture, which our men spent and gambled with in the most lavish manner. Having utterly ruined Columbia, the right wing began its march northward toward Winsboro on the 20th, which we reached on the 21st, and found General Slocum with the left wing, who had come by way of Alston. End of Sherman's March to the Sea and the Burning of Columbia, South Carolina from his memoirs by William Tecumseh Sherman. Recording by David Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.